The Mysterious Giant Serpent When sailing in the South Atlantic, officers and crew aboard the HMS Daedalus ship saw what they described as an enormous 60-feet serpent swimming with its head four feet above the water. Captain McQuaho also said that the creature passed rapidly, but so close under our lee quarter, that had it been a man of my acquaintance I should have easily have recognized his features with the naked eye. According to seven members of the crew, the mysterious creature remained in view for around 20 minutes. Lieutenant E. A. Drummond recorded the events in his diary the day he observed them and also made sketches of what he saw. It is said that the HMS Daedalus incident wasn't the only time the mysterious creature was sighted. Other supposed sightings of the creature occurred during the 19th century, mainly in the Atlantic, which lent it some public and scientific credibility as a real animal, but the HMS Daedalus sighting was the most notable one. There is no doubt that something remarkable passed by that ship on that day, and the Daedalus case has remained one of the most famous and puzzling maritime mysteries of all time. The Octavius The story of the Octavius is considered to be one of the eeriest ocean mysteries of all time. In 1762, a sailing ship named the Octavius departed China for London. The captain decided to go through the Northern Passage, but the ship never reached London. Many years later, the ship was found floating aimlessly with the whole crew frozen solid and dead. It was found 14 years later after it was last seen in 1762. It was October 11, 1775, when the whaler ship Herald stumbled upon a rather strange-looking ship. The crew of Herald thought that the badly weather-beaten ship was drifting, and decided to give it a closer inspection. They made their way slowly through the strange, creepy, and quiet ship. In the lower deck, they discovered 28 sailors, frozen stiff and completely motionless. When they reached the captain's office, they found him behind his desk, also frozen, and he was still holding his pen. The inkwell and other everyday items were still in their place on the desk. Turning around, they saw a woman wrapped in a blanket on the bed, frozen to death, along with the body of a young boy. It seemed that everyone on the ship has been frozen to death in an instant. Upon inspecting the captain's desk, the crew found a logbook that belonged to the captain. In it, the captain had documented the ship's journey when it began in 1762. The 13 years between 1762, when the ship departed from China, and 1775, when it was found by the Herald crew, were nowhere to be found in the logbook. With the realization that they are on board a ghost ship, the crew of the Herald were frightened of the Octavius and feared that it was cursed, so they quickly headed back to the Herald and simply left the Octavius adrift. To this day, it has never been sighted again. The Mysterious Vanishing of C-124 while flying across the Atlantic Ocean in 1953, a Douglas C-124 aircraft crashed with 53 people on board. The plane ditched safely in the Atlantic Ocean and all of the passengers survived. The C-124 ditched at approximately 700 miles southwest of Ireland. The aircraft was intact when it touched down on the ocean. All the survivors exited the aircraft wearing life preservers and climbed into the inflated five-man life rafts. The rafts were equipped with cold weather gear, food, water, flares, and emergency radios. Shortly after the men were in the life rafts, a pilot out of Ireland spotted the rafts and the flares that the men had ignited. Their location was reported, and the pilot left the scene when his fuel was getting low. No other United States or Allied planes or ships made it to the ditch site for over 19 hours, until Sunday, the 25th of March 1951. When the ships arrived, they discovered that the aircraft, along with its passengers and crew, have completely vanished. All they found were some charred crates and a partially deflated life raft. Ships and planes continued searching for the next several days, but not a single body was found, and the fate of the aircraft and the 53 survivors remains a complete mystery to this day. It has been theorized that the survivors may have been snatched by the Soviet Union for their intelligence value. No one knows if that's true or not, but it's not totally unlikely, given that Soviet vessels were active in the area during that time. Another theory claims that the Douglas C-124 Globemaster, along with its passengers and crew, might have been completely swallowed by an unknown gigantic ocean creature. A creature so large that it swallowed 53 individuals and an entire aircraft in one leap. The Strinze Beast 
On September 25, 1808, John Peace, a local man, fishing off the coast, was puzzled by the sight of seabirds flocking around what looked like an animal's corpse on the rocks. Turning his little boat, Peace made his way to the carcass. But what he found was unlike anything he had encountered before. Lying on the rocks were the remains of a large serpent-like creature, with a long, eel-like neck and three pairs of legs. The corpse was examined and meticulously studied ten days later by George Sherrard and three other men. The mysterious creature was described as serpentine, measuring exactly 55 feet long, but as part of the tail was apparently missing, the animal was actually longer than that, with a neck measuring 10 feet 3 inches long. The head was like that of a sheep, with eyes bigger than a seal's. Its skin was grey and rough to the touch. However, if stroked from the head down the back, it was said to be as smooth as velvet. Six limbs extended from the body and the beast had wiry hair that grew from its shoulders, down to its tail. The hair was said to glow eerily in the dark. By the end of September, news of Strunze's monster had spread far and wide. Because the remains had rotted away to practically nothing, the four men who had originally examined the carcass were taken to Kirkwall. There, they had to swear to the magistrate that their information was the truth. Scientists have theorized that the Strunze beast is most likely just a basking shark, an animal fairly common in the waters around Orkney. But the mystery doesn't end there. Even if the Strunze beast was nothing more than a dead basking shark, an element of mystery is still present. The longest recorded basking shark measured a mere 40 feet to 15 feet smaller than the remains of the Strunze beast. At 55 feet long from tip to tail, the shark that decomposed to form the Strunze beast must have been a monster in its own right. Scientists still fail to explain the huge length of the Strunze beast. The Devil's Sea The Devil's Sea is a mysterious area in Japan's corner of the Pacific Ocean where many ships have vanished, including multiple large vessels in the 1950s. In fact, between 1950 and 1954 alone, no less than nine large freighters reportedly disappeared in the area, and none of them managed to send out a distress call. When the Japanese government got fed up with the situation, they sent a ship called Kayomaru to research the situation. It disappeared too. Following this incident, the Japanese government reportedly declared this area dangerous for marine voyaging and transporting goods. Moreover, as a result of this unprecedented incident, all efforts to unearth the facts behind the mystery were also aborted completely. The continued mysterious existence of the Devil's Sea area is testimony that certain phenomena in the world are far beyond the control of human beings. On June 20, 1994, New Zealand was rocked by a tragic event that would go down in history as one of the country's most enigmatic and notorious crimes. David Bain, then a 22-year-old university dropout, called 111 to report that he had found his entire family murdered in their home in the small town of Dunedin. His parents, Robin and Margaret Bain, his sisters Arawa and Laniot, and his younger brother Stephen, had all been shot dead in their sleep. Initially, David was seen as the sole survivor of a brutal and senseless attack. However, as the police investigation unfolded, suspicions began to emerge that David was not the innocent victim he claimed to be. The prosecution would later argue that David, driven by a combination of family tensions and financial pressures, had killed his entire family before staging the crime scene to make it look like a murder-suicide carried out by his father. The trial was one of the most high-profile in New Zealand's history, lasting three months and attracting intense media scrutiny. In 1995, David Bain was found guilty of all five murders and sentenced to life imprisonment. However, he continued to maintain his innocence, and his case became a cause celebre for many who believed that he had been wrongly convicted. In 2007, after a decade of legal battles, a retrial was ordered, and David Bain was ultimately acquitted on all charges. The prosecution's case was heavily criticized, with forensic evidence called into question. However, the case remains controversial to this day, with many still divided on whether David was a victim of a miscarriage of justice or a cold-blooded killer who got away with murder. 
One of the most puzzling aspects of the case is the motive. While the prosecution argued that David was under financial pressure and had a strained relationship with his father, many of his friends and supporters insisted that he was a kind and gentle person who would never have committed such a heinous crime. The Bain family was also known to be deeply religious and tightly knit, making it difficult to understand why one of their own would have turned on them so violently. The crime scene itself was also highly unusual, with many of the bodies found in bizarre and contorted positions. Some have suggested that this is evidence of a struggle or an attempt to stage the scene, while others believe that it is simply a result of the chaotic and violent nature of the crime. Despite the acquittal, the Bain family murders remain one of New Zealand's most haunting unsolved crimes. The tragedy of a family torn apart by violence and the lingering uncertainty over who was responsible have left a lasting impact on the country's psyche. The case raises important questions about the reliability of forensic evidence, the challenges of investigating complex and mysterious crimes, and the ethical and moral considerations involved in cases where the stakes are so high. The fact that the case remains so controversial and divisive more than two decades later is a testament to the enduring power of this tragic and puzzling story. In the spring of 1922, a small Bavarian village called Hinterkaifeck was gripped with fear and horror when the Gruber family and their maid were found brutally murdered on their farm. The crime scene was particularly gruesome with each victim suffering from blunt force trauma to the head. The case has remained unsolved for over a century and has become one of the most perplexing mysteries in German history. Andreas Gruber, born in 1875, was a farmer who spent his entire life living and working on his family's farm in Hinterkaifeck. In 1914, he married his wife, Gazilia, and together they had two children. Victoria and Joseph. Andreas was known to be a strict and reclusive man, and Casilia was deeply religious. Victoria, on the other hand, was rumored to have had an incestuous relationship with her father and was often seen wandering the village alone. On the morning of April 1, 1922, a neighbor by the name of Michael Pohl went to the Gruber farm to inquire about the family's whereabouts as they had not been seen for a few days. He made a chilling discovery. The entire family and their maid, Maria Baumgartner, were all dead. The murderer had lured each victim to the barn one by one, using a mattock to bludgeon them to death. The baby, Joseph, was found in his crib with fatal injuries. The maid, Maria Baumgartner, was found dead in her bed with similar injuries to the other victims, indicating that she was likely surprised and attacked in the house. During the investigation, strange details emerged that only added to the horror of the crime. A set of footprints was found leading to the farm, but none leading away from it, suggesting that the killer had approached on foot but had not left the same way. Additionally, about a month before the murders, the former family maid, Crescent's Regia had reported hearing strange noises coming from the attic and even discovered a newspaper that did not belong to anyone in the family. The police were baffled by the murders and struggled to find any leads. Several suspects were investigated, including a former lover of Victoria's and a local man who had been seen around the farm in the days leading up to the murders. However, none of them were ever charged with the crime. The Hinterkaifeck murders have since become one of Germany's most notorious unsolved crimes. Over the years, numerous theories have emerged, ranging from a family member committing the murders to National Socialist soldiers being involved. However, none of these theories have been proven, and the case remains unsolved. The Hinterkaifeck murders have haunted Germany for over a century and it is unlikely that the truth behind this horrific crime will ever be uncovered. The Gruber family and their maid met their untimely deaths in one of the most gruesome ways imaginable, and the lack of resolution only adds to the tragedy. The case serves as a reminder that sometimes, even the most heinous crimes can go unsolved, 
leaving only questions and pain in their wake. The Woodleys were a seemingly ordinary family living in Cyprus, Texas. They had been happily married for many years, and with four children who were all well on their way to success, the Woodleys appeared to have everything going for them. They were financially comfortable and living in a comfortable suburban home. However, their lives were suddenly shattered on the evening of September 6, 1991. In just a matter of minutes, a mysterious person entered their home and murdered three members of the family, Father Barry and his two sons, 23-year-old Gregory and 15-year-old Jeremy. The surviving family members reported that the killer was a teenager named Shelby, who had responded to their advertisement on Craigslist in the Houston Chronicle to buy their piano. The murders were carried out in a brief window of just 10 minutes, and the two boys were tied together with nylon straps before being shot multiple times. The brutality of the murders has led some to believe that it was a professional hit. The Woodley's tragedy serves as a stark reminder that violence can strike anyone, anywhere, at any time. On June 4, 2001, 52-year-old Junko Yamagami was scheduled to take a business trip to Dalian, China for the travel company she worked for. Before leaving, she was also supposed to attend a meeting. By noon, after Junko hadn't shown up to her office or gotten on board her plane, her colleagues began to get worried. They checked her house, where she lived with her husband Masahiro and mother Nasigusa, but nobody appeared to be home. The family dog and Masahiro's car were gone too. The Yamagami's daughter, a 26-year-old elementary school teacher named Chie, was also missing. She lived alone in an apartment in nearby Teikara City, but came over to visit her parents the night before. Chie was the last member of the family anybody had seen. The Yamagami's front door was locked, but the back door was open. Nothing in the house appeared to be disturbed. The kitchen light was left on, all of the beds were made, and breakfast had been prepared. As ordinary as the scene appeared, however, there were a couple of strange details. The Yamagami's pajamas were missing, and while their shoes had been left behind, their sandals were gone. Junko's luggage and the 150,000 yen she needed for her trip were also inside the house, and so was Masahiro's pager. It seemed that the Yamagamis suddenly dropped whatever they were doing, took the family dog, and quietly left the house in their pajamas and sandals. A year into the investigation, the case seemed to be going nowhere. The Yamagamis had good reputations, and weren't involved with any particularly shady or dangerous people. Masahiro did have some money problems, but it wasn't serious enough to leave town. To some of their neighbors, the Yamagami's strange disappearance reminded them of an old story from Edo times. A female servant was said to have gone into the mountains one day and then disappeared. All the town people tried looking for her, but she was never found. On September 7, 2002, police recovered a car that was found submerged in a reservoir. The car contained the bodies of the four Yamagamis and their dog. No cause of death could be determined, but there were also no signs of anybody being attacked or bruised. The car was found in a neutral state. Masahiro's window was down, and everybody was wearing their seatbelt. The Yamagami's clothes were so damaged that the authorities couldn't determine whether they were wearing pajamas. Some glasses and an umbrella were also found. Because Masahiro was in the driver's seat, Police believe that it was a murder-suicide or group suicide. Now the suicide theory does seem credible. After all, why else would they have taken their dog? But the apparent suddenness of how the Yamagamis left is suspicious. If Masahiro really did kill everybody, how did he manage to convince the other family members to get in the car? Especially when they were getting ready to eat breakfast? Or did somebody force them to leave? Might they have been trying to get away from somebody? and Masahiro accidentally drove into the water? We most likely will never know. The Disappearance of Hoa Verde This small town in Brazil once housed 600 citizens who suddenly vanished without a trace. Supposedly a rather bustling community, it is thought to have disappeared sometime in 1923. 
a group of visitors stopped by the small village when they were greeted with an eerie silence. Virtually no one remained. The houses looked as though they were abandoned in a hurry, and food and personal artifacts were left behind untouched. The visitors contacted local law enforcement who subsequently launched an investigation, but could not find any sign of the inhabitants' whereabouts. One odd clue left behind was a gun that looked as though it had been recently fired, and a mysterious message written on a blackboard, that read, There is no salvation. One of the most bizarre theories floating around, states that the 600 residents of Hoa Verde, were swallowed by a black hole, taking them all to a fourth dimension. Another theory states that the residents might have been abducted by the aliens. And another theory claims that perhaps, the residents were evacuated by soldiers or revolutionaries. As disturbing as this may be, no one has been able to confirm what exactly happened in Hoa Verde. The Roman Ninth Legion The disappearance of the Ninth Legion is considered to be one of the greatest mysteries of history. The Ninth Legion was a Roman military formation of around 5,000 soldiers, stationed in York, Northern England, during Rome's occupation of Britain. It was one of Rome's oldest, most reliable, and most formidable fighting forces. They were considered an elite legion. The legion maintained control of the wild inhabitants of what would later become Northern England and Scotland. Sometime around the year 117 AD, the Ninth Legion marched north, to deal with a rising among the Caledonian tribes. They were never heard of again. The Ninth Legion just simply vanished from history and the archaeological record without a trace, and became the Lost Legion of Rome. What could have happened to erase the existence of 5,000 soldiers? No one really knows. However, there are various theories surrounding the demise of the Ninth. One theory suggests the Legion was simply sent elsewhere, though there's little evidence to support this. Meanwhile, Emperor Hadrian visited the British Isles at the beginning of the second century. To take control of the Britain on Roman violence, he ordered the construction of a 73-mile-long, 15-foot-high fortified wall across the island to keep the invaders out of Roman territory. Hadrian's wall still stands today. However, there's still no sign of the ultimate fate of the Ninth Legion. And there probably never will be. However, it is important to note that some people in York claim to have seen the ghosts of the lost Ninth Legion. One of the most notable sightings was the one that occurred in the early 1950s. A young plumber, by the name of Harry Martindale, had been repairing a boiler in the basement of the treasurer's house, which stands close to York Minster. He was about to pack away his tools when he heard what sounded like a trumpet. He thought at first it was perhaps a brass band in the street outside and so paid it little attention. Then came a second blast, only this time much louder and much closer. It appeared to be coming from the far end of the cellar. Harry peered into the dimly lit cavernous surroundings yet saw nothing. He was about to continue packing away his things when he found himself seized with horror. A horse's head suddenly appeared from out of the wall at the far end of the cellar. Its rider was then revealed, followed by 15 Roman soldiers. The weary and dejected-looking soldiers paid no attention to Harry as they shuffled their way across the cellar floor, only to disappear into the opposite wall. Harry claimed never to have had a paranormal experience until that day in the cellar, nor had he experienced one since. The Anjikuni Village Disappearance One of the greatest mysteries in the world, is the mysterious disappearance of an entire village near Anjikuni Lake, in Canada, during the 1930s. In 1932, a Canadian fur trapper named Joe, went to a village near Anjikuni Lake in Canada. He knew this establishment very well, as he would often go there to trade his fur and spend his leisure time. On this trip, he arrived at the village, and made a disturbing discovery. He found the village to be completely empty and eerily silent, even though there were signs, that there were people there a while ago. This had never happened to him coming to this village. People in this village have a reputation for hospitality. No matter whether it's day or night, they always welcome their guests, and arrange meals and delicious foods for them. This is why some of their special guests like Joe used to visit them regularly. Between 2,000 and 3,000 people, men, women, and children, seemed to have evaporated into thin air. Each shack he examined came up empty, and nothing had been taken from them. All the food, supplies, and weapons were there. What's even more puzzling, is that not a single footprint was present anywhere in the village. 
If we assume that the villagers had to evacuate the place for whatever reason, at least they would leave behind a footprint because the paths and the grounds were all covered with snows. But to Joe's surprise, he couldn't see the footprints anywhere other than his own boots. Now, he realized that something must have gone wrong. So he immediately went to the nearby telegraph office and reported to the Hill police forces about what he witnessed. The police reached the village and conducted an extensive search for the villagers, but were unable to trace them. However, they found something really strange. Almost all the graves in the village cemetery were empty and the bodies were taken away by someone. Afar from the village, seven corpses of dogs who starved to death were discovered, tied to some tree stumps. It appeared that the dogs were trying to protect their masters from something or someone. To this date, there's no proper explanation for the mass disappearance of the Anjakuni villagers. Though it is important to note that three days prior to the disappearance, other villagers near Anjakuni Lake reported that they had seen strange blue lights in the sky. Many people believe the Anjakuni people were actually abducted by aliens and the blue lights were their craft. The Flanan Isles Lighthouse On the 26th of December 1900, the lighthouse tender vessel Hesperus approached the tiny island of Eilean Moor to investigate a reported problem with the island's lighthouse. On approaching the island, the lighthouse sat eerily unresponsive to the ship's calls and signals. When relief keeper, Joseph Moore, was sent to investigate further, he was met with an eerie silence. Moore found the main door and gate to the compound closed, the beds unmade, and the clock stopped. He also found a set of oilskins, suggesting that one of the keepers left without them, which is unusual and worrying, considering the poor weather conditions that had been recorded. The island was searched for clues, or any sign of the keepers, but nothing was found. The West Landing had received considerable damage, with a turf ripped up and a box of supplies destroyed. The keeper's logs proved that this damage had occurred before the disappearance. The log leading up to the men's disappearance included some strange entries, with descriptions of an awful storm, high winds, and low spirits amongst the keepers. There were however no reports of storms in the area in the days leading up to the disappearance, meaning that the poor weather conditions recorded in the log were either made up, or localized. To this day no one knows what took place in the lighthouse that night. Though many theories have developed over the years. One theory suggests that the psychology of the lighthouse keepers played a part in the disappearance. One of the three men, MacArthur, had a reputation for brawling and was known to be violent. It is suggested by some that a fight broke out on the cliff edge, causing the men to fall to their deaths. Another theory suggests that a giant sea monster leapt out of the water and snatched the three men from the cliff edge. Other theories suggest that the three men might have been abducted by spies or aliens, or perhaps they had simply escaped to start new lives. The 5th Norfolk Battalion During World War I, in August 1915, the 5th Battalion of the Royal Norfolk Regiment disappeared without a trace, in the middle of the Dardanelles countryside, after entering into a strange cloud. How did an entire battalion vanish into thin air? Nobody knows. Between March and December of the year 1915, England and France tried to take control of the Dardanelles, a strategic point controlling communications between the Mediterranean and the Russian ports of the Black Sea. But the armies of the Ottoman Empire, commanded by the Germans, kept the Western Expeditionary Force in check. The losses were so great that the Allies finally abandoned the game in December 1915. The story of the Norfolk disappearance is told by the tales of Commonwealth soldiers who attended the event. On August 21, 1915, during the attack on the Gallipoli Peninsula, 22 New Zealand soldiers from an engineering company saw the 5th Norfolk Regiment, which numbered 267 men, coming to the rescue of the AN Zac. Attacking Hill 60, south of Suvla Bay, Norfolk soldiers enter a strange cloud. At the moment when all the men have disappeared behind the curtain of mist, the cloud rises gently then moves away in the sky, against the wind, and soon escapes the eyes of observers. No longer is a living being visible in the small valley. And Turkey claims to have never captured anyone from the Royal Norfolk Regiment. The mysterious moon music phenomenon occurred during the Apollo 10 mission in 1969, while orbiting around the far side of the moon, the astronauts on board the spacecraft heard strange and eerie whistling sounds or music coming through their headsets. Do 
York got quiet, didn't it? The sounds lasted for approximately one hour and seemed to be coming from outside the spacecraft. The crew members were quite unnerved by the experience and even considered the possibility that the sounds could be coming from intelligent extraterrestrial life. The incident was initially kept secret and only became known to the public in 2008 when transcripts of the mission were released to the public. The transcripts included conversations between the crew members and ground control about the mysterious sounds they were hearing. Despite extensive analysis and investigation, the source of the mysterious music has never been identified. It has been suggested that the sounds could have been caused by interference between the spacecraft's radio communication system and its power supply. Others have suggested that the sounds could have been caused by natural phenomena, such as electrical discharges in the moon's atmosphere. It is worth noting that the Apollo 10 astronauts were not the only ones to report hearing strange sounds while in space. Other astronauts, such as those on board the International Space Station, have reported hearing unexplained sounds or space whispers while on missions. However, the exact cause of these sounds remains a mystery. The Mars Observer was a highly advanced spacecraft that was designed to study Mars from orbit, and it carried a suite of scientific instruments that were capable of making detailed measurements of the planet's surface and atmosphere. The spacecraft was also equipped with a camera that was capable of taking high-resolution images of the Martian surface. On August 21, 1993, just three days before the spacecraft was scheduled to enter orbit around Mars, all communication with the spacecraft was lost. Despite numerous attempts to re-establish contact with the spacecraft, no signal was ever received and the Mars Observer mysteriously vanished. NASA launched an extensive investigation into the incident, but the cause of the spacecraft's disappearance remains unknown to this day. Some theories suggest that a fuel line may have ruptured, causing the spacecraft to lose power, while others speculate that it may have collided with a small meteorite or been hit by a solar flare. However, none of these theories can be proven. Now, is it possible that the Mars Observer was deliberately sabotaged by a foreign government or organization? Mars has long been a topic of interest to governments around the world, and some may view the exploration of Mars as a way to gain an advantage in space or on Earth. Additionally, some people may view the disappearance of the Mars Observer as evidence of a larger conspiracy involving government cover-ups and secret agendas. Could the Mars Observer have been targeted by extraterrestrial life forms? Some people may believe that extraterrestrial life forms could have been responsible for the disappearance of the Mars Observer because of the long history of UFO sightings and conspiracy theories related to extraterrestrial life. Some may view the disappearance of the Mars Observer as evidence that aliens are monitoring human activity in space and are actively working to prevent humans from uncovering the truth about their existence. Yan Liwei is a Chinese astronaut who became the first person to be sent into space by the Chinese space program in 2003. During his space mission, he reported hearing a series of strange knocking sounds in his spacecraft. This mysterious phenomenon has puzzled many people and sparked numerous theories over the years. The knocking sounds that Yan Liwei heard have been described as a series of metallic, rhythmic, and intermittent sounds that seem to come from outside the spacecraft. The sounds were loud enough to be heard over the communication system and lasted for about 20 seconds. According to Yang, the sounds were unlike anything he had ever heard before and it sent chills down his spine. Several theories have been proposed to explain the strange knocking sounds. One possibility is that the strange knocking sounds could have been caused by extraterrestrial life. Some people believe that Yang may have been visited by aliens and that they were knocking on his spacecraft to let them inside. However, there is no concrete evidence to support this theory, and it remains purely speculative. Another theory suggests that the sounds were caused by micrometeoroids hitting the spacecraft. Micrometeoroids are tiny particles that travel through space and can cause damage to spacecraft. It is possible that some of these particles hit the spacecraft and caused the knocking sounds that Yang heard. Another theory is that the sounds were caused by thermal expansion and contraction of the spacecraft's metal structure. As the spacecraft moved in and out of the Earth's shadow, the temperature of the metal would have changed, causing it to expand and contract. This could have created the knocking sounds that Yang heard. In conclusion, the mystery of the strange knocking sounds that Yang Liwei heard in his spacecraft remains unsolved. While there are several possible explanations, none of them have been proven. To this day, no one actually knows what caused these strange knocking sounds. 
The first reported sighting of the Black Knight satellite was in 1954 by a civilian observer named Donald Kehoe, who claimed to have seen a dark object in orbit around the Earth. Later that year, newspapers reported that the U.S. Air Force had detected a mysterious object in space that was orbiting the Earth. In 1960, the U.S. Navy claimed to have detected a dark, tumbling object in space, but they soon dismissed it as space debris. Later, in the 1970s, astronomers picked up signals from space that they believed to be coming from the Black Knight satellite. Despite the lack of strong evidence, some people continue to believe that the Black Knight satellite is evidence of extraterrestrial life. Some theories suggest that the object is a remnant of an ancient alien civilization that visited Earth in the distant past. Others speculate that it is a monitoring device left behind by a more advanced civilization. Another theory is that the Black Knight satellite is a secret government project, possibly related to espionage or military surveillance. Some people believe that the satellite is part of a larger network of secret satellites that are used for covert operations. There have also been claims that the Black Knight satellite is responsible for interfering with spacecraft and communication satellites. However, these claims have not been substantiated. The WOW signal is a mysterious radio signal detected on August 15, 1977, by the Big Ear Radio Telescope at Ohio State University. The signal was so unexpected and unusual that astronomer Jerry Emmon wrote WOW on the printout, hence its name. Despite many subsequent attempts to detect the signal again, its origin remains unknown. The signal lasted for a total of 72 seconds, and it was detected in the 1420 MHz band, which is the frequency of hydrogen. It appeared to come from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius, and it was 30 times stronger than the background radiation of the universe. Despite numerous attempts to detect the signal again, it has never been observed again. This has led to speculation and theories as to its origin and meaning. One theory is that the signal was of extraterrestrial origin, possibly from an intelligent alien civilization attempting to make contact with humans. The signal's characteristics and its narrow bandwidth support this theory, as they are consistent with what one might expect from an extraterrestrial transmission. However, there is no direct evidence to support this theory, and it remains speculative. Another theory suggests that the signal may have been generated by a natural phenomenon, such as a comet or a pulsar. However, this theory also has its limitations, as the signal was never detected again despite numerous attempts to do so. Finally, some scientists have proposed that the signal may have been a result of human interference, such as a transmission from a nearby spy satellite. However, this theory is also challenged by the signal's characteristics, which do not resemble any known human-made signal. In conclusion, the WOW signal remains one of the most intriguing mysteries in the history of astronomy. While there is no conclusive evidence to support any theory, the possibility that the signal was of extraterrestrial origin is high. The Well of Hell Surrounded in mystery and tales of demons, the Well of Barhut in Yemen's east, known as the Well of Hell, is a little understood natural wonder. The giant hole in the desert of Almara province is 30 meters wide and thought to be anywhere between 100 to 250 meters deep. Local folklore says it was created as a prison for the jinns and demons, a reputation bolstered by the foul odors rising from its depths. It is said to be the most hated spot in the earth, to God, and from it, will be the destruction of the world. Some say that it was the jinn who dug this deep hole for one of the kings of the Himyarite who ruled the region in the old time to hide his treasures. Others believe that it was dug up to be a jail for the jinn who came out of control. The inhabitants of the region have many strange tales about the well. One of which tells us that in the past, people have been through a period of severe drought. So they tied a man with ropes and slowly lowered him into the well to bring water. When he reached the middle of the well, he screamed in terror to be lifted up back to surface. When they raised him, they found only half of his body. Another tale claims that one sheep herder put her baby near the well, and when she looked away for a split second, the baby disappeared in the blink of an eye, and was never seen again. Yemeni officials say they don't know what lies below. It's very deep, We've never reached the bottom of this well, as there's little oxygen and no ventilation," said Sulla Babher, Director General of Mara's Geological Survey and Mineral Resources Authority. We have gone to visit the area and entered the well, reaching more than 50 to 60 meters down into it. We noticed strange things inside. We also smelled something strange. 
It's a mysterious situation. Sunlight doesn't extend far into the structure, and little can be seen from the edge except the birds that fly in and out of its depths. Videographers seeking close-ups of the inside of the well have said they are almost impossible to capture. Local superstition has it that objects near the hole can be sucked towards it. Babher said that the well was millions and millions of years old. These places require more study, research and investigation, he said. Over the centuries, stories have circulated of malign, supernatural figures living in the well. Many local residents remain uneasy about visiting the vast hole, or even talking about it, for fear of ill fortune from a chasm which, legend has it, threatens life on Earth itself. HR 4796 HR 4796 is a star in the southern constellation of Centaurus. Measurements put it at a distance of 235 light years from the Earth. This star is believed to be about 8 million years old, and it has a radius about 168% of the radius of the Sun and 218% of the Sun's mass. What makes the HR 4796 really creepy is the fact that it is harboring a circumstellar debris ring. This mysterious alignment of the star and the debris ring resembles a giant eye. Hence, it was given the nickname, Sauron's Eye. Vejo Ronkonen Sculpture Garden Finnish artist Vejo Ronkonen constructed nearly 500 concrete figures and displayed them on the grounds of the home he had lived in since birth. The majority of these are human statues performing a variety of activities, one noteworthy site features a group of roughly 200 figures, in various yoga poses. The sculptures possess an otherworldly and at times downright sinister quality, with blank, sunken eyes, skeletal body proportions, ghoulish grins, and, in some cases, the use of real human teeth. Non-human figures include large tree-like structures with cone-shaped branches. Following the artist's death, the sculpture garden and accompanying property was purchased by Finnish businessman Reino Yuzitalo who plans to refurbish the sculptures as needed, and offer guided tours of the premises. The Christ of the Abyss The Christ of the Abyss is a bronze statue of Jesus Christ made by Guido Galetti. It was placed upon the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, as an honor to Dario Gonzat, the first Italian to use scuba diving gear. It is located off San Fruttuoso between Camogli and Portofino on the Italian Riviera. It was installed 17 meters under the waves in August of 1954, where it stays to this day. Similar statues have been placed underwater and above ground all over the world, some as an homage to the original, others as mere tangential copycats. The original clay statue from which this first sculpture was cast is now in Ravenna, Italy's National Museum of Underwater Activities. The Miraculous Staircase Located in the Loreto Chapel in Santa Fe, New Mexico, United States, the mysterious Miraculous Staircase defies the laws of physics. It rises 20 feet to the choir loft while making two full turns, all without the support of a newel or central pole. It is built mostly out of wood and is held together by wooden pegs, with no glue, nails or other hardware used. The inner stringer consists of seven wooden segments joined together with pegs, while the longer outer stringer has nine segments. The exact wood used to build the staircase has been confirmed to be a type of spruce which is not native to New Mexico and scientifically not identified anywhere else in the world. Handrails were added later in 1887, and an iron bracket was later attached to a column to add additional support. The staircase is supported by an inner wood stringer. Apart from any claims of its miraculous nature, the staircase has been described as a remarkable feat of woodworking. According to a Washington Post column by Tim Carter, it's a magnificent work of art that humbles me as a master carpenter. To create a staircase like this using modern tools would be a feat. It's mind-boggling to think about constructing such a marvel with crude hand tools, no electricity, and minimal resources. The identity of the builder is also a complete mystery. It is believed that one day a mysterious man came to the door of the church, looking for work. He showed up with nothing but a box of rudimentary tools and a donkey. The description that they gave of the man matches the biblical description of Saint Joseph himself. He's often shown with a set of tools, and of course the donkey is a familiar image in many nativity scenes. The mysterious man didn't give his name, but he told the nuns to leave him be for a while so he could build a stairway for the choir loft. 
His only stipulation was that the nuns would keep the church clear of visitors while he was working. The nuns agreed. From there, the story varies. Some people say they came back in just a couple days, and others say a few months. At some point, though, the nuns came back to the church to find the Loretto staircase. And the man was gone. The staircase was built with a double helix shape, which included two 360-degree turns. This is both rare and extremely difficult. To top it off, the miracle staircase has no visible supports. There was no central pole to support the stairs, which means that the entire weight of the structure rested on the bottom step. The staircase is held together with wooden pegs. No nails were used at all. And the last puzzling and inspiring element, there are 33 stairs leading up to the choir loft, notably the age of Jesus when he was crucified. PSR B150958 What you see in this image is the remains of a star that exploded 17,000 light years away. The astronomers who captured this image with a NASA space telescope call it the hand of God. What the image exactly shows is an object called a pulsar wind nebula, a dying star and the cloud of materials left over from the star after it exploded. The particles are interacting with nearby magnetic fields, causing the particles to glow in the image. One of the big mysteries of this object is whether the pulsar particles are interacting with the material in a specific way to make it look like a hand, or if the material is in fact shaped like a hand. The Rohonk Codex The Rohonk Codex was discovered in 1838, written in an indecipherable language. It's still not clear whether the text should be read from left to right or right to left. The 450-page long manuscript was first discovered at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in 1838. Since its discovery, scholars, linguists, and codebreakers have been trying to decipher the unknown language of the manuscript, but, up to today, not a single word has been decoded. The manuscript contains about 90 illustrations of battles and various religious themes. The Rohonk Codex first appeared in 1743 in one of the catalogues of the Rohonk Library. Scholars and scientists are still scratching their heads trying to decipher the weird characters in the Codex. So, who wrote this mysterious manuscript, and why? Was it the aliens? A religious cult perhaps? Nobody knows. The Devil's Bible. This medieval manuscript has haunted readers for hundreds of years. The Devil's Bible, or Codex Gigas, is the largest medieval manuscript in existence. It is 36 inches tall, 20 inches wide, and 9 inches thick. It is said to have been written by a single anonymous person in Bohemia. The Bible contains both the Old and New Testaments, a textbook for teaching medicine, and a calendar. The Bible appears normal at first, but when you open page 577, you will find this. A full-colored drawing of Satan. How the unholiest creature of all, Satan, made its way into this most sacred text, is a complete mystery. Was this giant Bible written by the devil himself? One legend claims that a monk who broke his monastic vows, was sentenced to be walled up alive. In order to avoid this harsh penalty he promised to create a book in one night to glorify the monastery forever. Near midnight, he became sure that he could not complete this task alone so he made a special prayer, not addressed to God but to Satan, asking him to help him finish the book in exchange for his soul. The devil completed the manuscript and the monk added the devil's picture out of gratitude for his aid. Less Prophecies Less Prophecies, or, The Prophecies, is a collection of prophecies by French physician Nostradamus. Less Prophecies appeared in the 15th century, by the publishing house May Spana. It includes three whole centuries and 53 quatrains. The prophecies in the book do not follow a chronological order and were written combining different languages, such as, French, Greek, and Latin. It is believed that it contains anagrams, mythological and astrological references, in a language that makes comprehension difficult. Some scholars claim that Nostradamus did this to evade the Holy Inquisition, for fear of being persecuted for heresy. Most of the quatrains deal with disasters, and Nostradamus gained notoriety for the belief in his ability to predict the future. 
It is believed that less prophecies predicted major historical events like the rise of Adolf Hitler, the 9-11 attacks, the slaying of JFK, Napoleon's conquests, the French Revolution, the death of Henry II, the Great Fire of London, and other major disasters. All the prophecies in Less Prophecies are written in four lines of rhyming verse. Shams al Ma'arif. Shams al Ma'arif, or The Son of Knowledge, is a book full of deep and complex meanings related to the secrets of the universe. It is an ancient book that is said to be cursed by an order of jinn. Legend has it, it's the most dangerous book ever written. Written in Egypt in the 13th century by a Sufi mystic and mage of Algerian origin, Shams al Ma'arif presents the fundamentals of Arabic Islamic occult work. From spiritual cosmology and astrology, including various particularly lunar magics, to working with spirits and jinns, magical employment of letters and numbers, and the occult applications of the Quran, thereby comprising a veritable encyclopedia of Islamic magical wisdom and formulae. The book has been banned and suppressed throughout the entire Arabic world, though it is still being read and studied up to the present day. Many Sufi orders, such as the Naqshbandi order have recognized its legitimacy in use as a compendium for the occult, and hold it in high regard. Nag Hammadi Codices Nag Hammadi Codices are a group of books that comprise the Gnostic Bible. In 1945, an Arab peasant named Muhammad Ali al Salman discovered a clay jar in the deserts of Upper Egypt, which contained 13 books that were bound in leather. He dumped the books at his family's house while he and his brothers went out to enact a blood feud against another man. Some of the books were accidentally burned in a cooking fire, while the rest were eventually sold on the black market, until they attracted the attention of Egyptian officials, who confiscated several of the books, and housed them in the Coptic Museum of Cairo. The codices were eventually discovered to be secret sacred Christian texts. The books were created over 1,500 years ago, during the first centuries of Christianity. Some of them had never been mentioned before, in any Christian literature, others had been declared heresy, and banned by the church. They offer a counterpoint to accepted Christian literature, and have been controversial ever since their discovery. The Wisconsin Werewolf The Wisconsin Werewolf, also known as the Beast of Bray Road, is a humanoid wolf-like creature that was sighted multiple times during the 1990s, near the towns of Delavan and Elkhorn in Wisconsin. Because of the numerous witnesses who have claimed to see this creature, the evidence supporting the Wisconsin werewolf is far greater than the evidence supporting almost any other werewolf legend. It is believed that the creature is responsible for numerous brutal animal mutilations that took place in the area around Bray Road. The creature targeted deers and livestock. It partially ate their remains then removed specific organs from their carcasses. The Wisconsin werewolf is most often described by alleged witnesses as large, anywhere between 6 to 7 feet tall, with a humanoid-style body, covered in fur or hair, and with a head resembling a wolf or a bear. It is purported to have been seen moving on two legs and sometimes on four legs. It is believed that the first time the creature was ever sighted was in 1936. The most notable sightings of the Wisconsin werewolf took place in the 1980s. Several alleged witnesses reported that the beast had left long scratch marks on doors and trunks of their cars. One witness stated she hit something while crossing Bray Road. Upon exiting her vehicle to determine what she had hit, supposedly a large wolf-like creature with red eyes chased her back into her car, leaving claw marks in the rear passenger door. Sightings also have been reported during daylight hours, with several witnesses stating they observed an unusually large wolf-like creature running on all fours through cornfields. Reported sightings continue, most recently in February 2018 and July 2020 when alleged witnesses observed a large, hair-covered upright creature in Spring Prairie and Lyons, both in Woolworth County. Indrid Cold Also known as the Grinning, or, Smiling Man, Indrid Cold is a mysterious alien entity that was sighted several times in New Jersey during the mid-1960s. It is believed that Indrid can predict the future and speak telepathically. Most individuals who encountered Indrid described him as human-like in appearance, with a cartoonishly wide and long, eerie smile on his face. Indrid had a tendency to eerily smile at almost everyone that encountered him. 
it is believed that he still haunts West Virginia to this day. On December 15, 1967, American investigator John Keel reportedly received a phone call from Indrid Cold while he was on the Silver Bridge. Indrid told John Keel on the phone to run away because a terrible disaster was about to happen. As John Keel escaped, the Silver Bridge collapsed, resulting in the deaths of 46 people. Indrid was reportedly sighted for the first time, just one month before the Silver Bridge incident happened. On the 1st of November, 1966, a salesman was on his way to his home when he noticed strange light in the distance. After he got closer to the source of the light, he found that it was actually a weird, lamp-looking, spacecraft-like vehicle. The door opened, and a man got out from the spacecraft, walking towards the salesman. The man spoke to the salesman telepathically, introducing his name as Indrid Cold. After the two had a conversation, where he said he was an alien from a distant planet and meant no harm to humans, he said that he will visit the salesman again. He then entered his spacecraft and disappeared. The salesman ended up contacting the police, trying to tell them the story, trying to convince them that it's real, but, they didn't believe him. Fast forward a couple of weeks, and the salesman got interviewed by news outlets. After the interview, other people went forward and told their experiences with Indrid Cold as well. Some people described him as a six-foot, bald humanoid creature that doesn't have any ears, nose, facial hair, or eyebrows. It is believed that Indrid has the ability to shapeshift and switch between two physical forms. Perhaps he shapeshifts into a normal-looking human to conceal his true alien identity at some times. That explains why some people said he didn't have any nose, ears, or hair, while others have said he looked just like any normal human being. While Indrid Cold was described to be utterly insane and psychopathic by some people, he never actually harmed anyone. In fact, some people even said that he was a non-malevolent alien who wants to help humans be safe by warning them of future disasters. Indrid Cold has been seen in connection with multiple UFO sightings. If Indrid is an extraterrestrial being, then he may have intentionally gone a bit overboard with the smile in order to appear friendly to humans. The Barsa Jorn The Barsa Jorn, or Lord of the Woods, is a hairy and generally peaceful giant, originating from Basque and Navarre mythology. The Barsa Jorns were thought to build megaliths, and keep the secret to various skills and technological advancements humans learned through trickery. People who saw the Barsa Jorn described it as a huge humanoid, anywhere between 9 to 16 feet tall, covered in fur, and sporting a beard and long hair. The Barsa Jorn also had a female counterpart, the Basan deer, which lacked the beard. The Barsa Jorns were usually shepherds, often seen taking care of huge flocks of sheep, whistling and shouting to warn human shepherds of incoming storms or wolf packs, expecting a piece of bread in return, which would be collected while they slept. The Barsa Jorns made use of their strength to build megaliths, dolmens, and cromleks. They also knew agriculture, music, ironworking, carpentry, architecture, and similar technologies long before humans did. The Barsa Jorns were believed to inhabit a torn and gory as forests in the Basque country and the Irati jungle in Navarre. No one knows if they still exist or not. The Mothman the Mothman is a strange, flying, bird-like creature that has been sighted numerous times, most often before a disaster strikes the area of the sighting. It is described as tall, with large moth, or bat-like wings, no neck, and large red glowing eyes. It is sometimes described as being human-like in shape, and sometimes bird-like. The Mothman was first sighted in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, from November 12, 1966, to December 15, 1967. It was said to have chased a couple's car, flying at speeds exceeding 10 miles per hour. It was seen and heard several other times during the next months, and was described similarly each time. Sightings continued until the tragic collapse of the Silver Bridge in the area. After that, the Mothman mysteriously disappeared. The Mothman has been sighted many times since then in other places around the globe, always before a catastrophic and destructive disaster strikes. There are a few theories on what Mothman really is. Some suggest that it is a paranormal creature, such as an alien or demon. Some people even say that Indrid Cold and Mothman are the same creature, or that both of them are related somehow. Others say it is simply a misidentified or unknown species of bird. The Dover Demon 
The Dover Demon is a small humanoid alien-like creature that was reported in Dover, Massachusetts. It was the subject of an intensive scare during the 1970s, when multiple witnesses came forward with their sightings. The Dover Demon is described as looking sort of like the gray variety of alien, except that it has rosy tan-colored skin instead. The Dover Demon has a large head on a small, stick-like body. It can be bipedal, but it often travels on all fours or switches back and forth between the two modes of locomotion. It has eyes that glow, usually orange, or sometimes green. It does not seem to wear any clothing, and unlike the greys, the Dover Demon does not seem to be associated with any UFOs. It just wanders around on its own. The strange tale begins at 10.32 p.m. on April 21, as three 17-year-olds were driving north on Farm Street. The boy behind the wheel spotted something creeping along a wall of loose stones on the left side of the road. At first he thought it was just a dog or a cat, until his headlights shined on it and he realized it's nothing he's ever seen before. The figure slowly turns its head and stares into the light, its two large, round, glassy, lidless eyes shining brightly like two orange marbles. Except for its oversized head, the creature is thin, with long spindly arms and legs, and large hands and feet. The skin is hairless and peach-colored and appears to have a rough texture. Standing no more than three to four feet tall, the figure is shaped like a baby's body with long arms and legs. It had been making its way along the wall when the car lights surprised it. Unfortunately, neither of the two other companions saw the creature. The sighting only lasted a few seconds and, before the boy behind the wheel could speak, the creature left the scene. The boy dropped his friends off and went to his home. Visibly upset, he walked through the door and his father asked him if something was wrong. The boy relates the story and later sketches what he's seen. Cryptozoologists seldom show interest in the Dover Demon. Mainstream cryptozoologists are rarely willing to seriously investigate humanoids other than hairy humanoids. It seems that sightings only happen during a short time period, with most claiming that sightings have now ceased, so the Dover Demon does not seem to be a pressing matter. If the creature exists, then it seems that it is introverted and reclusive by nature, with no intent to harm humans. During the 1980s, a restaurant owner received multiple mysterious phone calls from an unknown person mimicking the voice of a little girl. The mysterious caller would often threaten to kill Bashir and his entire family, and if that wasn't chilling enough, these calls kept coming for more than nine years. The story begins with a man named Bashir Kachachi. Born in Syria and raised in Lebanon, Bashir was a successful restaurant owner who moved to the United States during the 1970s. By 1983, Bashir and his sister had opened up the Moroccan-themed restaurant, Marrakesh which had separate establishments in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. While the Washington restaurant was still under construction, a phone line was installed, and Bashir started receiving multiple calls in which there would only be silence on the line. And if that wasn't eerie enough, when Bashir installed an answering machine, he started receiving messages containing weird, disturbing sounds and laughter. After the restaurant opened, the calls continued and escalated into harassment. Whenever Bashir or any of the other employees answered the phone, their lives would often be threatened and they'd often hear sounds like screaming and machine gun fire on the line. The caller started mentioning specific details about Bashir's personal life to suggest they knew him personally and were watching him. Since a large number of calls featured recordings of a child's voice, the caller earned the nickname Lanfan, which means, the child, in English. Over the course of the next decade, the Marrakesh restaurant would receive an average of 15 to 20 calls per day from the child. When Bashir traveled to his sister's restaurant in Philadelphia, the child started phoning him there. One day, Bashir discovered that some stars of David had been carved into his Mercedes. And on another occasion his Jeep started overheating and he discovered that someone had tampered with the spark plug wires, which came close to igniting the fuel lines. Bashir finally went to the FBI, which placed a tap on the restaurant's phone. Over an 18-month period, they recorded over 3,000 threatening calls from the child, which originated from payphones in the DC metro area. 
These calls would often be made from different pay phones at different locations within seconds of each other, which meant that multiple people had to be involved. The FBI never caught anyone in the act and Bashir eventually decided to check himself into a mental health facility in order to escape this nightmare. While Bashir was in the hospital, his replacement at the DC restaurant, Raj Tuli, became the target of the harassment. The caller threatened to kill him, and also claimed to know his exact schedule, movements, and the location of his home. Three weeks after Raj became manager of the restaurant, his son Richard was targeted. While walking home from school, two men approached him, asking if he was Richard. When he responded, they brutally attacked him. Later that day, the child called Raj and confirmed that they had attacked his son. The next day, someone painted Richard will die on the front door of Raj Tuli's home. Bashir even continued getting calls from the child inside the mental hospital and spent years checking himself. However, after this story got featured on the TV show, Unsolved Mysteries, in 1993, the harassment campaign finally subsided. Bashir checked out of the hospital for good, but no one ever discovered the identity of the child. Bashir believed the whole thing was somehow connected to a bizarre incident from Beirut that happened in July 1974, when he showed up to pick up his wife at a private party and was kidnapped by a group of unidentified armed men. These men held Bashir prisoner at a Palestinian refugee camp and accused him of working for the CIA. They proceeded to interrogate and torture Bashir for the next five days before he attempted suicide by slashing his wrists. Believe it or not, Bashir's kidnappers actually took him to a hospital for medical attention and he was able to secure his release. Bashir believed that the Palestine Liberation Organization was responsible for his abduction, and maintained he was an innocent victim of mistaken identity, but suspected the incident was somehow connected to his ordeal with the child. It's worth noting that Bashir found himself at the center of controversy in 2002 when he paid to publish an ad for the Marrakesh restaurant in the Washington Post, and it contained the line, Have Zionists turned Jewish beliefs into a political party in the service of hatred and greed? By this point, Bashir was convinced that the Jews and the Israeli government were responsible for his 1974 kidnapping and the subsequent harassment from the child. The ad drew a massive backlash, and for years, Bashir ran an extremist socio-political website filled with anti-Semitic, racist, homophobic, and misogynist rants. It's been debated if Bashir always held these views and did something to anger the child, or if his extremist behavior might be the direct result of the child's harassment campaign, which took a severe toll on his mental health. Either way, the full story behind the child, or Lanfan, remains unknown. The Trofimov Beheadings On December 15, 2012, Judge Vladimir Trofimov 58, his wife Irina 59, their son Sergei 30 and his girlfriend Marina Zuiva 29 were found murdered in their home in the city of Kharkiv, Ukraine. All the bodies had been decapitated and their heads were missing. The judge, his wife and son's partner were killed and then beheaded while the son was beheaded while still alive. Sergei was an information technology specialist and worked from home. Police is not sure what was used but it could have been a machete, sword or axe. Investigators believe that maybe the murder was connected to his job because the murder took place on December 15th which is Judge's National Day in Ukraine. Trofimov was well known for collecting rare coins, World War II medals and China statuettes. Several antiques were reportedly missing, so robbery was another motive. The prosecutor said that the quadruple slaying had been carefully planned. He added that at least two people were involved in the killings. Witnesses saw the judge leave his apartment and then return between 8.30 to 10 a.m. on Saturday. The police was called at 1.02 p.m. Saturday by a 40-year-old man who had found the bodies and who was a close relative. The mystery of the Trofimov beheading still remains unsolved to this day. Y-O-G-T-Z-E also referred to as the Autobahn Riddle, the Y-O-G-T-Z-E case is one of the most cryptic unsolved cases in German history. In 1984, a man named Gunther Stoll from Anshausen in Germany suffered from bouts of paranoia. Previously a food technician, he later became unemployed. 
Stoll concerned his wife as he would frequently tell her he was being followed by people who wanted to kill him. He would talk about them, telling her they were coming after him, but would never specify who they were. At first, it seemed to be a classic case of paranoid schizophrenia. His wife never believed anyone was actually coming after Stoll. On the night of the 25th of October 1984, Stoll sat quietly with his wife in the living room of his home. He abruptly jumped to his feet, declaring Jets get mere EIN licked off, which roughly translates to, now I get it or, now I understand in English. On a piece of paper, he wrote down the phrase, Y-O-G-T-Z-E, a random string of letters that are meaningless in both English and German. He left the house not long after, and his wife never saw him again. After Stoll left home, he went to his favorite pub in Wilmsdorf at around 11 o'clock at night. After ordering his first beer he collapsed to the floor, losing consciousness and injuring his face. He wasn't drunk, and other punters said he hadn't touched his drink. After waking, he told those around him that he had suddenly gone. He left the pub as abruptly as he'd left his house. He drove to a nearby town called Hager Seelback, where he'd grown up. At around one in the morning, he went to the house of an elderly woman he was acquainted with from his childhood. He told her he knew a terrible event was about to happen, saying, something's about to happen tonight, something pretty terrifying. Concerned, she suggested he told his parents what he was worried about. He told her he couldn't because they wouldn't understand, he would go home and tell his wife instead. He never made it home. At around 3 in the morning, two truck drivers discovered a crashed car off the Hagensud exit, over a hundred kilometers away from Hager Seelback. The truck drivers looked inside the car, crashed in a trench alongside the highway. They found the barely conscious Gunther Stoll, naked and severely injured. They saw another man walking away from the wreckage, but he disappeared. While waiting for police to arrive the men spoke with Stoll, who told them four other men had been in the car with him, but they had run away. They asked him if the men were his friends, and he said no, they were strangers. Stoll died on the way to the hospital, unable to explain any more. The fact that Stoll was naked, confused the investigation, as police could see no reason for it. They were further mystified following his autopsy, as the coroners concluded that Stoll did not die from the car accident. He had been injured elsewhere before the accident, the perpetrators must have placed him in the car and driven him to the crash site. After digging into Stoll's life, police could find no reason why he would be a target for murder. He had no criminal record, no past history with drugs. Nothing suggested anyone wanted him dead aside from the ramblings to his wife. The most likely scenario seemed to be that he stripped naked, was hit by a car, and was then placed in his own car either before or after it had crashed. None of the men he claimed to have been in the car with were ever found. Is Y-O-G-T-Z-E the meaningless scribble of a madman, or the key to his death? The case was deemed a murder by German authorities but has never been solved. The case has been re-examined yearly ever since, but so far, all its questions remained unanswered. Perhaps Stoll was an unfortunate victim of crime who also happened to suffer from paranoid delusions. Or perhaps he somehow held the key to solving his own murder, one too cryptic for his killers to face Judgment Day. The Krasnoyarsk Child Killings On April 16, 2005, five boys who studied at the same school, aged 9 to 12, went for a walk and then completely vanished. The boys' names were Maxim Tomanov, Safar Aliyev, Galash Mamedgasinov, Alexander Lavrinov, and Dmitry Makarov. They were last seen on Glinka Street, just a couple of blocks away from their school. At first, police thought that the children had run away from home, but then they quickly changed their theory to kidnapping and then to murder. People who knew the boys did not believe the runaway theory as only one of the boys had a somewhat unhappy family situation and had run away before. The other four boys were good students, had no family problems and never ran away before. Many people searched for the boys, including up to 5,000 police officers. Their bodies were finally found on the morning of May 8, more than 20 days after their disappearance. Everything about this case is bizarre. 
You see, they were found in a sewer in the middle of an abandoned plot of land not that far from their school or from where they were last seen and very close to some of the boys' homes. Burned beyond recognition. Moreover, this particular sewer was searched just three days before by police and by Lavranov's father. On May 8, scrap metal collectors noticed that there was some strange trash on top of the manhole cover on the abandoned plot. They removed a tire and a pallet from the cover and discovered the bodies inside the sewer. And then silence. No one knew anything except that the boys were found and they were burned. The police wasn't releasing any information. At this point it started to seem that there will be no answers. And there aren't. Almost two decades passed and the mystery still remains unsolved. The Inokashira Park Dismemberment Incident on April 23, 1994, a cleaning staff member of Tokyo's Inokashira Park found a garbage bag in the park's trash can. She thought the bag contained raw fish, but when her colleagues opened it to see what was inside, they found a human ankle. The police were called in, and the bag was found to contain a total of 24 pieces of human flesh, including two feet, two hands, and a shoulder. At an autopsy conducted at Kairan University Hospital, the cause of death was deemed unknown. The parts had been completely drained of blood, and to make the case even weirder, each piece was cut exactly to the length of 20 centimeters. Although a third of the body was never found, including the head, the pieces were identified three days later as belonging to a 35-year-old architect named Siichi Kawamura. Kawamura lived less than a mile from the park, and was last seen on April 21st. He ate dinner with his family that evening, and afterward went out to karaoke with an old co-worker. He left his friend around 11 p.m., but never returned home. His family reported him missing the next day. Despite police questioning some 37,000 people, the case has never been solved. There were reports of two suspicious men walking in the park and carrying a plastic bag around 4 a.m. on the day Kawamura's body was discovered, but they have never been identified. Other witnesses said that they heard the sound of a car colliding with something in the very early hours of the 22nd. It's been suggested that Kawamura was struck by a car, and that his killers cut him up to get rid of the body. One popular rumor even claimed that Kawamura had been a member of a religious cult, and was brutally murdered after trying to leave it. Whether the murder was the attempt to hide a tragic accident, or the work of a deranged surgeon, perhaps we'll never know. Adam on September 21, 2001, the torso of a young boy was discovered in the River Thames, near Tower Bridge in central London. Dubbed Adam by police officers, the unidentified remains belonged to a black male, around 4 to 8 years old, who had been wearing orange girl's shorts. The post-mortem showed that Adam had been poisoned, his throat had been slit to drain the blood from his body, and his head and limbs had been expertly removed. Further forensic testing examined his stomach contents and trace minerals in his bones to establish that Adam had only been in the United Kingdom for a few days or weeks before he was murdered. And that he likely came from a region of southwestern Nigeria near Benin City known as the birthplace of voodoo. This evidence led investigators to suspect that Adam was trafficked to Britain specifically for a muti killing, a ritual sacrifice performed by a witch doctor that uses a child's body parts to make medicinal potions called muti. About 10 years later, it was reported that the torso was that of a six-year-old named Ik Palm Woza, after a television crew managed to track down a woman who used to care for him in Germany, due to his parents being deported back to Nigeria. Joyce Ojajid, a mother of two, had told ITV's London Tonight that she handed the six-year-old to a man reportedly named Bawa who proceeded to take the child to London. Detectives said that this was a major breakthrough. In February 2013, the BBC was contacted by Ojajid, who declared that she was prepared to tell them everything she knew about the boy. Ojajid revealed that Adam's real name was in fact Patrick Erhaber, and not Ikpamwosa. She also identified Bawa as Kingsley Ojo, and said that she had wrongly identified a photograph that had been circulating in the press as Patrick, when it was in fact of a friend's living son. However, police doubts about her mental state meant that these claims are doubted by detectives, and thus, Adam has never been formally identified. In Ibadan, Nigeria. March 22, 2014. 
A group of fellow Okada writers set out to find one of their missing colleagues after having received several distressing text messages from him. In the texts, Kazim revealed that he had been lured to a dilapidated building in the forest of Saka, and that he was being held captive. Unbeknownst to his captors, Kazim had managed to hide away a phone with which he contacted his colleagues and described the place he had been taken to. An abandoned construction site in the forest where unspeakable evils were being committed. The forest of Saka has been described as a dangerous area, particularly at night. But few were aware of just how dangerous it really was, or exactly what those dangers entailed. Following the clues provided by Kazim, the search party discovered the building, and the scene they encountered would be seared forever in the darkest depths of their minds. The stench of death reached out for miles, decomposing bodies were littered around the rundown structure. They found piles of human skulls, rows of unmarked graves, and trails of dried blood. Inside and around the building a score of men and women were found still alive, though they were skin and bones, ribs jutting out from their chests. Many of them were catatonic. All of them wore haunted expressions on their faces. Later, one of the rescued women would claim that she had delivered a baby just two days prior, but that her child had been taken from her and presumably sold. Some could not recall what had been done to them. Perhaps they had been sedated, or their minds had simply rejected the horrific memories. Their captors were nowhere to be found. Theories abounded on what had transpired in the Ibadan Forest of Horror, the consensus being that black magic was at the root of it all. Nigerian juju is said to offer its practitioners anything their hearts might desire. Love, money, happiness, vengeance. Typically the offerings for the rituals are simple, harmless things. Strands of hair, a handful of nail clippings, a few drops of blood. But for more potent and darker spells practitioners mix organs and severed body parts, and sometimes blood from babies, with particular charms. With the right charm and the right offering, Juju fanatics believe that they can conjure money, warp the minds of men, and shape their very fates to their liking. Albinos are especially targeted, as their body parts are said to bring wealth, healing, and good fortune. According to some locals, people would visit the forest in the dead of night to purchase body parts for their rituals. It was speculated that the kidnappers were backed by affluent Nigerians, among them top government officials who believed that Juju was the source of their good fortune. However, no concrete evidence could be found to support the theory. People had been disappearing from the area at an alarming rate, with many having been missing for years. When news of the discovery broke, devastated families flocked to the abandoned building in an attempt to rescue their loved ones and seek justice against the perpetrators. Riots broke out and security guards were called in, ostensibly to protect the property of construction companies in the area, but where had they been before? The situation quickly escalated from canisters of tear gas to beatings and gunshots. One woman was hit by a stray bullet and later died of her wounds. Enraged young men killed local livestock in revenge, claiming that the owners could not have been unaware of what had been going on right under their noses. Kazim was described as a gentle and hardworking person by those close to him. His texts helped lift the lid on the unspeakable evils of the Ibadan forest of horror, saving the lives of many, but sadly not his own. His body was never found. The Ibadan House of Horror was eventually demolished and a school now stands in its place. No justice was ever served, and the harrowing case remains unsolved to this day. There are many mysteries in the world that we still cannot explain. Whether you're into solving puzzles or just want to know about interesting things, mysteries are a great way to spend your time. Today I am going to talk about a mysterious discovery from the North Atlantic, a discovery that still baffles scientists to this day. A couple of years ago, a team of scientists were sailing in the North Atlantic when they made a chilling discovery. What the team of scientists discovered was unlike anything they had seen before. They found a mysterious dark-colored shark that looked as if it was hundreds of years old. When scientists conducted some experiments and studies on the shark, they found that the shark was indeed very old. Like, very, very old. 
the Greenland shark, which grows only 1 cm per year, is estimated to have lived for 512 years. This means that this shark is as old as the Mona Lisa painting and existed way before William Shakespeare was born. The shark was born in 1505, which makes it the longest living vertebrate in existence. Even the oldest living shark ever recorded, before the discovery of this Greenland shark, lived for only 250 years. The Greenland shark that was discovered recently, is a true genetic anomaly, that will probably never occur again. Now just imagine with me again, this shark existed since 1505. It was literally alive during the founding of the US, both World War I and II, the sinking of the Titanic, the rule of King Henry VIII, the exploration of the Americas by Christopher Columbus, and before Michelangelo began painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. If that isn't mind-blowing, then I don't know what is. This shark is a living time capsule. Scientists still cannot understand or explain how this shark was able to survive for more than 500 years. It is one of the biggest mysteries of the world. The Tully monster is an enigmatic creature that lived over 300 million years ago during the Carboniferous period. It was first discovered in Illinois in 1958 and scientists still can't agree on what kind of animal it is. Some suggest that it was a worm-like creature, others believe it was a type of mollusk or even an alien that arrived from a distant planet. The Tully monster remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the fossil record. It was a soft-bodied, bilaterally symmetrical animal with a distinctive long, tube-like body that measured about 14 inches in length. It had a long proboscis with a sharp tooth at the end, which it likely used to capture prey. It also had stalked eyes, a pair of fins on either side of its body, and a series of small, bristle-like structures along its back. Despite its unique appearance, the Tully monster's classification has long been a mystery. It has been variously classified as a mollusk, an arthropod, and a chordate, but none of these classifications can fully explain all of its features. Recently, new research using advanced imaging techniques has shed some light on the Tully monster's anatomy, but its exact classification remains a subject of debate among scientists. The mystery of the Tully monster continues to fascinate paleontologists and the public alike, and it remains one of the most enigmatic creatures to have ever roamed the Earth. Meet the tardigrade, also known as the water bear or moss piglet. These microscopic creatures are some of the toughest creatures on Earth, able to survive extreme conditions that would kill most other living things. They have been around for over 500 million years, and there are over 1,000 known species. They are found in space and almost every habitat on Earth, from the highest mountains to the depths of the ocean. Tardigrades can survive temperatures as low as 272 degrees Celsius and as high as 151 degrees Celsius. They can even withstand pressure six times greater than that found in the deepest part of the ocean and radiation doses 1,000 times higher than lethal levels for humans. Tardigrades have a mouth and a digestive system, but they can also absorb nutrients through their skin. They have been known to eat bacteria, algae, and even other tardigrades. Despite all of the things that we know about these creatures, we still have much to learn about them. For example, we don't know exactly how they are able to survive in space, where they are exposed to extreme radiation and vacuum conditions. These creatures are considered mysterious because they have several unique and intriguing characteristics that scientists are still working to fully understand. Like for example, their extreme resilience. Tardigrades are known for their ability to survive in extreme conditions, such as extreme temperatures, high levels of radiation, and even the vacuum of space. The mechanisms that allow them to do so are not fully understood, and studying tardigrades' resilience could lead to new technologies and medical treatments. Cryptobiosis Tardigrades are capable of entering a state called cryptobiosis, in which they essentially shut down their metabolism and can survive for long periods of time without food or water. This state is not fully understood, and researchers are still investigating the molecular mechanisms involved. Unique Anatomy Tardigrades have a unique anatomy that sets them apart from other animals. For example, they have a segmented body with four pairs of legs, a stylet used to puncture food sources, and a tardigrade-specific protein that is found nowhere else in the animal kingdom. These unique features are still being studied to understand their functions and evolutionary history. 
The tardigrade is a true marvel of nature, a tiny creature that has managed to survive in some of the most extreme environments on our planet. Who knows what other secrets these mysterious creatures might be hiding? The Kraken is a legendary sea monster that has been described in various forms throughout history. Now hold on, I know what you might be thinking right now, that I am trying to convince you of the existence of a creature that is often considered mythical. However, I ask that you keep an open mind for a moment. While there is no definitive proof of the Kraken's existence, there have been numerous sightings of this monstrous sea creature in different parts of the world, which suggests that there may be a chance that the Kraken is real. It is said to be a massive cephalopod, similar to a giant squid or octopus, with long, tentacle-like arms and a huge, bulbous head. For centuries, sailors have shared stories of encountering this monstrous sea creature, and the legend of the Kraken has captivated people's imaginations for generations. Some stories describe it as being as large as an entire island, capable of dragging entire ships and their crews to their doom. There have been many reported sightings of the Kraken throughout history, particularly in the North Atlantic and the seas around Norway and Greenland. One of the earliest known accounts of the Kraken dates back to the 13th century, when the Norse sagas described it as a creature that would surface from the depths of the ocean to attack ships. In the centuries that followed, many sailors reported encountering the Kraken. Some described it as a massive, shadowy shape looming beneath the surface of the water, while others claimed to have seen its enormous tentacles rise up out of the sea. The legend of the Kraken is particularly terrifying because it was believed to be capable of sinking entire ships with ease. Sailors told stories of the Kraken attacking their vessels, wrapping its tentacles around the hull and dragging the ship and its crew down into the ocean's depths. It's important to note that some of these stories are likely exaggerated or outright false, and there is no concrete evidence that the Kraken ever existed. However, some other stories may be genuine and we have no reason to assume that they are false. This tiny, translucent immortal creature has been baffling scientists for years with its incredible traits and features. First off, let's clarify what we mean by immortal. While the immortal jellyfish can't live forever, it has an extraordinary ability to regenerate itself. When it reaches the end of its life cycle, instead of dying like any other creature, it reverts back to its baby form and starts its life cycle all over. This process is known as transdifferentiation, and it's something that no other animal in existence can do. But the immortal jellyfish isn't just remarkable for its ability to regenerate. It's also deadly and venomous. The immortal jellyfish has the ability to kill a human with its small, hair-like tentacles that contain thousands of tiny nematocysts, which are stinging cells that release venom when they come into contact with something. Despite its incredible traits and features, the immortal jellyfish is still a mystery to scientists. They're still trying to understand how the jellyfish is able to regenerate itself and maintain its youthful state. Some scientists believe that the jellyfish is able to reverse the aging process by resetting the DNA in its cells, while others think that it's able to maintain its telomeres, the protective caps on the ends of chromosomes that shorten as we age. Hello and welcome to this video on the Overtown Bridge Mystery. If you haven't heard of this before, it's a strange phenomenon that has puzzled researchers for years. The Overtown Bridge is located in Scotland and has been known for a series of unexplained incidents in which dogs have apparently leapt off the bridge to their deaths. In this video, we will explore the history of the Overtown Bridge, the incidents that have occurred over the years, and the various theories proposed to explain this bizarre mystery. The Overtown Bridge was built in 1895 and is located in the village of Milton, near the town of Dumbarton in Scotland. The bridge is a popular tourist attraction and is known for its unusual architecture, with its gothic arches and parapet walls. The bridge spans a 50-foot drop to a narrow gorge that runs beneath it. The phenomenon of dogs jumping from the Overtown Bridge was first reported in the 1950s. Over the years, numerous dogs have been reported to have leaped from the bridge to their deaths. Most of these incidents occurred in the same spot on the bridge, between the two highest points of the arches. This bizarre phenomenon has led to various theories as to why it occurs. Some suggest that the bridge is haunted by the ghost of Lady Overtown, the wife of the original owner of the bridge, who died in 1908. Others propose that the dogs may be picking up on some kind of scent or sound that is luring them over the edge. In recent years, researchers have studied the area and come up with some possible explanations for the phenomenon. 
One theory suggests that the bridge's walls and surroundings may create an optical illusion that disorients the dogs and causes them to lose their balance and fall. Another theory is that the bridge's location, which is adjacent to a mink farm, may be attracting the dogs, as mink urine has been shown to have a strong attraction for dogs. However, some researchers believe that there may be more to the story. Dr. David Sands, a Scottish animal behaviorist, has studied the incidents and has proposed that the dogs may be experiencing a form of canine suicide. He suggests that certain breeds, such as retrievers, may have a genetic predisposition towards suicidal behavior. Despite these studies and theories, the mystery of the Overtown Bridge remains unsolved and the phenomenon continues to attract visitors and researchers from around the world. There have been many controversies surrounding the incidents, including accusations of animal cruelty and calls for the bridge to be closed to the public. In conclusion, the Overtown Bridge mystery is a bizarre phenomenon that has puzzled researchers for years. While there are several theories as to why dogs have been leaping from the bridge, the true cause of the phenomenon remains unknown. Whether it is a haunting, an optical illusion, or some other unknown factor, the mystery of the Overtown Bridge continues to fascinate and perplex visitors and researchers alike. I hope that this video has given you some insight into the history and the strange occurrences surrounding this enigmatic bridge. On the 29th of September, 1988, a young boy was walking on the banks of the Garapiranga artificial lake after school, looking to play with birds and insects. As the boy was walking, he spotted something really strange in the distance. It looked like a large group of vultures, gathered around something. The group of vultures was so large that the boy wasn't able to tell what exactly they were gathering around. Curious to know what lay beneath them, the boy walked towards the group of vultures and dispersed them by throwing a stone at them. And it was at this moment, the boy discovered something straight out of his nightmares. Something that terrified him to the core. It was the horribly mutilated corpse of a middle-aged man. I'm not exaggerating when I say horribly mutilated. I saw the pictures of the corpse myself on Google, and I do not advise you to do the same. So after the boy found the corpse, he ran towards the nearest village and breathlessly told the villagers what he saw at the reservoir. The police were later informed, and a fire truck and a team of detectives from Santo Amaro Police Department arrived on the scene. The detectives weren't able to comprehend what exactly was lying in front of them. The corpse was missing the eyes, ears, lips, jaw, and anus. Also there were strange, cookie-cutter-like, holes all over the body, and, not a single drop of blood was found anywhere. The scene was so horrific and disturbing that the detectives were questioning what, or, who, exactly could have done this to another human being, and if it is even possible for a human to inflict these kinds of injuries on another person. The wounds on the man's body were so strange and uncommon that all the detectives agreed that this is something different than anything they ever encountered before. By late afternoon, the area was closed and the site was filled with police officers and medical personnel trying to figure out what happened to this man. Many rumors circulated over the next few hours amongst the villagers, and nothing was reported on the evening newspaper. The police, medical personnel, and everyone else on the site, left at night without getting noticed by the villagers. And then there was silence. No one knew anything except that something really mysterious and terrifying was found on the reservoir on the 29th of September that year. And the incident began to slip from the minds of the villagers after some time. In 1994, just six years after the enigmatic discovery, forensic reports and photographs somehow got leaked to the press and reports appeared in various newspapers and publications. Someone working in the government must have found this case so disturbing and creepy that they decided to break their silence and leaked all the information to the public. According to the autopsy report, the corpse was missing eyes, ears, lips, jaw, scrotum, anus, heart, as well as the entire digestive system and some other organs. All wounds and mutilations were cauterized. The incision in soft parts and in natural orifices by means of aspiration is suggestive of modus operandi. That is, according to the coroner. Some mechanical instrument was inserted through the belly and aspirated the internal organs, while the skin and tissue moles were extracted with precise surgical cuts. Examining the rest of the body, they found that each of the two armpits has been punctured by a single hole of 1.5 inches in diameter. Similar holes were found on the legs and arms. All of the holes were symmetrically aligned. 
Most alarming of all, the body was showing signs of vital reactions, this means that the man was still alive while everything was happening. This man suffered a really horrific and agonizing death. There was no sign of anesthesia or any other paralyzing agent. He felt everything that was happening to him. All the cuts and holes on his body were made with the help of surgical blades and technology that are far beyond human expertise and comprehension. All of the blood had been completely sucked from his body by some sort of mechanical instrument. Everything was done with precision and with technology that we aren't aware of. Was this man the victim of an alien experiment? It has been theorized that the man suffered from a cardiac arrest and died on the spot, and that the injuries found on his body were caused by animals drawn to the scent of his corpse. While some injuries on the body indicate that vultures were feeding on the corpse, there are many other injuries and wounds that were clearly inflicted by mechanical instruments and surgical blades. Also the autopsy report indicated that the man died two days before he was discovered, so it's impossible that his organs decomposed to practically nothing in such a short period of time. The organs were nowhere to be found, they didn't just decompose, they were clearly harvested by something, or someone. Also if the Garapiranga man really died due to natural causes, then why did the authorities hide this case from the public for six years? Another theory suggests that the man could have been murdered. While it's not totally impossible, it's just highly unlikely. If it was a murder, then this means the murderer must have possessed highly exceptional skills and knowledge in human anatomy and had highly advanced, never seen before, mechanical instruments that helped him perform such precise surgical procedures on the man's body while the man was alive and without anesthesia. The final, and perhaps, the most far-fetched theory out of them all, suggests that this was the work of either aliens or supernatural entities. Well, this one is also highly unlikely, but many people believe it because it seems to be the most fitting for such a bizarre and mysterious case of unexplained death. For over three decades, no one was able to come up with a proper explanation for the strange death of the Garapiranga man, and the harrowing case remains completely unsolved to this day. Our hearts go out to the family and friends of this poor man. May he rest in peace. On the 10th of September, 2021, at around 3.30 p.m., 29-year-old Jason Cortez was walking on a hiking trail at the Montecito Heights Park. Cortez was unexpectedly shot in the back with a sniper rifle. He collapsed to the ground and was immediately rushed to a nearby hospital, where he was pronounced dead. The police believes that the perpetrator was possibly 75 to 100 feet away from Cortez when they fired the shot. The perpetrator is described as male, anywhere between 20 to 30 years old, and anywhere between 5 feet 9 inches to 5 feet 11 inches tall. He was also wearing a blue hoodie at the time of the murder. Family and friends of Cortez described Cortez as a creative person who was passionate about making music and editing videos. Cortez had flown to the city the previous day and was working on a project with a friend when he was senselessly sniped for no apparent reason. Detective Alex Abundis said, this is another representation of just another senseless killing. There is no reason, there is no motive behind this. Cortez's wife, Corina Solorzano, said that Cortez was her first boyfriend, and that he was an amazing son, brother, and loyal friend. It has been almost a year and a half since Cortez was killed at the Montecito Heights Park, and the case still remains unsolved. On the evening of December 22, 1981, Rhonda Hinson was attending a Christmas party at the American Legion Hut in Hickory. After leaving the party around midnight, she stopped by a friend's house to pick up her vehicle and call her boyfriend. After leaving the friend's residence, Rhonda drove her beige that sun, west, on Interstate 40 and exited onto the Mineral Springs Highway 350 off-ramp. She turned right and began driving up a steep hill toward her home, when suddenly she was struck in the back by a high-powered rifle bullet that pierced both her heart and lung. Rhonda was later found lying in a ditch beside the open driver's door of her car. She was shot less than a mile from her home. The medical professionals who examined her body said that she would have been rendered incapacitated after being shot, yet her body was found lying outside the vehicle. Did the perpetrator pull her body from the car? Did Rhonda know the perpetrator? Was she randomly targeted? Was this a case of mistaken identity? 
Throughout the years, hundreds of people were interviewed by the investigators. The crime scene and evidence have been analyzed and reanalyzed. Yet Rhonda's death and the strange circumstances around it remains a complete mystery to this day. Jason Ellis was a young police officer from Bardstown, Kentucky, who joined the force in 2006. Ellis usually worked the night shift with his canine partner, Figo, who spent most of their time taking drugs off the street. On the 25th of May, 2013, Jason completed an arrest of an unidentified individual and brought them to the Bardstown jail. After that, he signed off for the night and left the police station to go to his home. When Jason approached the exit 34 ramp of the Bluegrass Parkway, he noticed several tree branches obstructing the road. Fearing for the safety of the public, Jason got out of his car to move the branches. As he was moving the branches, he would be fatally shot multiple times by a sniper rifle. A few minutes later, two passersby discovered Jason Ellis's unconscious body and immediately called an ambulance. Jason was later pronounced dead on the scene. After an extensive investigation, the police revealed that this was a premeditated ambush. The sniper intentionally placed the tree branches on the road and then situated themselves on a nearby hill. However, it's unclear whether the murder was random or not. Did the sniper know personal details about Jason Ellis and chose to target him in particular by ambushing him after his work shift, or did the sniper target random drivers on the road? No suspect has ever been publicly named, and Jason's case still remains unsolved to this day. On the 23rd of June, 2001, Artis White took his wife Benita and their five-year-old daughter, Michaela, to the picnic area right outside the Potter Park Zoo. After a while, Michaela wanted to leave the picnic area and go inside the zoo with her friends. Benita and Artis argued together and decided that one of them should go pick up their seven-year-old daughter, Alana, who was at a different city park, so she could enjoy the zoo with Michaela too. Artis got in the van and left Potter Park to go get Alana. Benita and Michaela were walking from the picnic area to the zoo entrance when, shortly after 3 p.m., a loud gunshot was heard throughout the park. Lying on the sidewalk was Benita White. A bullet had hit her in the left arm, pierced her heart, then exited out of the right side of her body, killing her instantly. She was killed in front of her daughter. The police immediately arrived to the scene and evacuated the area because they thought there was an active shooter. The next day, investigators and canine dogs searched the park for evidence. They meticulously searched everywhere for the bullet that killed Benita, though they were never able to find it. Two days later, the police determined that the shot came from a high-powered rifle, north of the park, about 100 yards away. At first, the police suspected Artis White, who was a detective sergeant for the Michigan State Police by the way, because the couple were in the process of getting divorced. Jonathan Preby, a detective that was involved in the case, said, did somebody just fire a round in the air, half a mile away? Was it a gang initiation, a serial sniper murder? All those were looked into seriously and disproven. The only person they could find with a possible motive was Artis. Since Artis had left the park just minutes before Benita was killed, and knew where she would be walking, police figured he had an opportunity to get in position to make the shot. They also theorized that maybe he paid a hitman to do the job instead of him. After a lengthy and extensive investigation, the police weren't able to convict Artis due to the lack of evidence against him. Also it was concluded that Artis had a solid alibi. For two decades, Artis has maintained that he is innocent, in front of the public, and criticized the police in his book, Who Killed My Wife, for doing a poor job at investigating his wife's murder. In the book, Artis details how he felt like the investigation was conducted poorly. He says that the Michigan State Police and Lansing Police spent too much time arguing over jurisdiction during the first 48 hours, the most critical time of an investigation, when they could have been gathering key evidence. Besides that, they never tested him for gunpowder residue on his arms and hands. It has been two decades since Benita White was murdered at the Potter Park Zoo, and the case still remains unsolved. This serial killer is believed to have operated in the southeastern United States during the 1970s and 1980s. He is suspected of having killed at least nine women, many of whom were sex workers or drug addicts. The killer was believed to be a police officer or former police officer as he seemed to have a knowledge of law enforcement tactics and procedures. The Bible Belt Strangler was never actually caught or formally identified. 
Most of his victims were young women with red or auburn hair who were found along highways in the southeastern United States. The killer's modus operandi involved strangulation, and in some cases, the women's bodies showed signs of sexual assault. Law enforcement agencies in several states worked together to investigate the case, but they were hampered by a lack of evidence and a lack of communication between agencies. Some of the victims were never identified, which made it difficult to connect the crimes and establish a pattern. Over the years, several suspects have been put forward in connection with the case, but none of them have been definitively linked to the murders. At first, the investigators theorized that the killer was a long-haul truck driver who used the interstate highways to travel between states. But it was later concluded that the killer was a police officer who used his knowledge of police procedures to avoid detection. The Bible Belt Strangler case is one of the most perplexing unsolved mysteries in American history. Despite the best efforts of law enforcement, the killer was never caught and the families of the victims were left without answers or closure. About four days ago, a mysterious massive metal sphere has been discovered on a Japanese beach, leaving locals and netizens stunned and speculating about its mysterious origins. The almost 1.5 meter wide sphere, with two raised handles and an orangish, rusty exterior, was found on Enchuhama Beach in the city of Hamamatsu by a passerby who reported it to the authorities. Police quickly sent a bomb squad to investigate and to ensure the safety of the area, blocking off a 200 meter radius around the object. Upon inspection, it was discovered that the sphere is hollow and likely had been hooked to something else. The origin of the sphere is unknown, and authorities have confirmed that it poses no threat. Speculations are flying as to what this sphere could be. Internet sleuths have called it everything from a Godzilla egg to a Dragon Ball from the popular anime of the same name. Others have even suggested it could be a piece of espionage technology or a spy balloon following the recent reports of the U.S. shooting down a large Chinese spy balloon and the removal of smaller objects from airspace over Canada, Alaska, and Lake Huron. Despite these wild theories, it is most likely that the sphere is a detached mooring buoy. These objects are usually floating, permanent objects that secure vessels while in deep or shallow water. However, no one knows for sure, and the mystery only deepens. One unnamed local man claimed that the sphere has been on the beach for some time now, and he even tried to push it but couldn't budge it. As local authorities continue to investigate and study the object, the world awaits eagerly for answers. Could this sphere be a remnant of an ancient civilization, a futuristic technology, or perhaps even an extraterrestrial object? Only time will tell. So, what do you think this mysterious sphere could be? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Deep beneath the Earth's surface, there lie mysterious underground cities that have baffled historians and archaeologists for centuries. These cities were built by unknown civilizations, and their secrets have remained hidden for ages. Today, I will take you on a journey to discover four of the most mysterious underground cities that no one can explain. Located in the heart of Edinburgh's old town, the Edinburgh Vaults are a series of underground chambers and tunnels that were built in the late 18th century. Although their original purpose is still debated by historians, it is believed that they were used as storage spaces for various businesses and as accommodation for the city's poor and homeless. But the mystery surrounding the Edinburgh vaults goes beyond their original use. For starters, no one knows who built them. Although there are a few theories, including one that suggests they were built by the city council, there is no concrete evidence to support any of them. This lack of information has only added to the vault's mystique over the years. But it's not just the identity of the builders that remains a mystery. There are also a number of other strange and unexplained occurrences that have taken place within the vaults. For example, there have been reports of strange noises, eerie whispers, and even sightings of mysterious supernatural entities. Some people have claimed to feel a presence within the vaults, and others have reported feeling as though they were being watched. One particularly creepy story involves a group of people who were exploring the vaults when they heard what sounded like someone or something dragging a heavy chain along the ground. When they investigated the source of the noise, they found nothing, but the sound continued to follow them throughout the vaults. Some have speculated that this could be the ghost of a former resident who was chained up and left to die within the vaults. All of these mysterious happenings have led to the vaults becoming a popular destination for paranormal investigators, ghost hunters, and thrill seekers. The Scylla Kingdom was founded in 57 BC and lasted until the 10th century AD. 
During this time, the kingdom was a major power in the region, and the burial mounds of Scylla served as the final resting place for many of its kings and queens. The tombs are large, earthen mounds that are lined with stone chambers, and they feature many unique architectural features that reflect the culture and beliefs of the Scylla kingdom. The burial mounds of Scylla are a unique architectural and archaeological site, and they provide valuable insights into the history and culture of ancient Korea. The tombs are massive, with some of them measuring up to 22 meters in height and 45 meters in diameter. They are constructed from earth and stone, and the stone chambers within the mounds contain many valuable artifacts, including pottery, metalwork, and jewelry. The tombs are also decorated with intricate carvings and paintings that reflect the beliefs and customs of the Scylla kingdom. Despite the many unique features of the burial mounds of Scylla, much about their history and their builders remains a mystery. While it is believed that the tombs were constructed by the Scylla kingdom, there are no historical records or artifacts that can definitively identify the builders or their purpose. The scale and sophistication of the tombs suggest that they were built by a highly organized and advanced society, but the identity of this society remains unknown. The Gaziamir underground city is a vast network of tunnels and chambers that stretch for miles beneath the city of Izmir. The city is believed to be thousands of years old, but its exact age and the identity of its builders remain a complete mystery. The tunnels and chambers are carved out of the soft volcanic rock that is abundant in the region, and the city is thought to have served as a refuge and a hiding place for its inhabitants during times of war and conflict. The city features many unique architectural features, including ventilation shafts, wells, and even a system of underground waterways that provided the city with a constant supply of fresh water. The tunnels and chambers are also lined with niches and alcoves that served as living spaces and storage areas for the city's inhabitants. The city is also home to several underground churches, which are still visible today, and which suggest that the city may have been used as a hiding place for early Christians. Despite the many unique features of the Gaziamir underground city, much about its history and its builders remains a mystery. While it is believed to be thousands of years old, there are no historical records or artifacts that can definitively identify its builders or its purpose. Some believe that the city may have been built by the Hittites, an ancient civilization that lived in the region thousands of years ago, while others suggest that it may have been built by aliens. The Nowers underground city is believed to be several centuries old, with the first recorded mention of the site dating back to the 9th century. The city is carved out of the soft limestone rock that is abundant in the region and features a network of tunnels and chambers that stretch for over 1,500 meters. It is believed that the city was used as a refuge and a hiding place for local inhabitants during times of war and conflict, and it is thought that as many as 3,000 people may have lived in the city at one time. The Nowers underground city features many unique architectural features, including wells, ventilation shafts, and even a chapel, which suggests that the city may have been used as a place of worship by its inhabitants. The tunnels and chambers are also lined with niches and alcoves that served as living spaces and storage areas for the city's inhabitants. The city is also home to several murals, inscriptions, and carvings that provide a glimpse into the lives and beliefs of the people who lived there. Despite the many unique features of the Nowers underground city, much about its history and its builders remains a mystery. While it is believed to be several centuries old, there are no historical records or artifacts that can definitively identify its builders or its purpose. Some believe that the city may have been built by the Romans, while others suggest that it may have been built by local farmers during the Middle Ages. Deep in the dark abyss of the ocean lies one of the most mysterious creatures that have ever existed. A creature so elusive, so rare, that only a handful of people have ever seen it. It is the Megamouth Shark. The Megamouth Shark was first discovered in 1976, off the coast of Hawaii, when a U.S. Navy research ship accidentally caught one in its nets. The Megamouth Shark's mysterious nature has led some people to speculate that it could be a remnant of an ancient shark species that has been long extinct. The Megamouth is truly one of the rarest and most mysterious sharks in existence. It is known for its large mouth and filter feeding behavior, but scientists are still trying to understand its ecology and behavior due to the difficulty of studying it in its deep sea habitat. It is estimated that there are only around 100 recorded sightings of this creature. We basically know very little about it. 
The megamouth shark is a filter feeding shark, meaning it feeds on plankton and other small organisms that it filters through its large mouth. Its mouth is so big that it can swallow a human whole, but don't worry, the megamouth shark is harmless to humans. We still don't know much about the shark's behavior, its breeding habits, or even its lifespan. It's a very enigmatic creature. The megamouth shark is a living fossil, a window into the past that can tell us a lot about the evolution of sharks and their role in the ocean's ecosystem. The billy ape is a mysterious primate that has been reported in the forests of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The animal is said to be much larger and more aggressive than any other primate known to man. Adult males can weigh up to 220 pounds and stand up to 6 feet tall. Despite their size and strength, billy apes are notoriously difficult to spot in the wild. They are incredibly shy and tend to avoid human contact whenever possible. They live in small family groups of 10 to 20 individuals and are expert climbers and swimmers. One of the most remarkable things about the billy ape is its incredible strength. These primates have been known to use sticks and branches as weapons to defend themselves against predators and even each other. In fact, billy apes have been observed killing lions, which is an incredibly rare feat for any animal, let alone a primate. This should give you a clear idea of just how strong these primates really are. So, what gives the billy ape its incredible strength and fighting prowess? One theory is that they have evolved to be larger and stronger in order to compete for resources with other animals in their environment, including other chimpanzees. Another theory is that they have developed their formidable skills in order to protect themselves from humans who have encroached on their natural habitat and posed a threat to their survival. Despite their reputation as fearsome creatures, billy apes are actually quite gentle and social animals. They are known to groom each other and play, much like other primates. They also have a unique vocalization system which allows them to communicate with each other over long distances. On the 6th of January, 1979, Tan Kyun and his wife, Li Mai, left their home and went to work at around six and a half in the morning, leaving their four children home alone. Both Tan and Lee worked together on a school minibus and transported students every day. Their children, Kok Peng, Kok Hin, Kok Soon, and Chin Nei, were all still asleep when they left for work. At around 7.10 a.m., the mother phoned the children multiple times to wake them up, as she usually does, but received no answer. She then phoned one of the neighbors and asked them to knock on the door of the house. The neighbor went to the house and knocked on the door, but also received no reply. When the couple returned home at around 10 in the morning, they discovered something that will haunt them for the rest of their lives. Lying in front of them was the lifeless bodies of their four children, piled on top of each other, in the bathtub. They were savagely hacked and slashed to death, probably with a machete or a cleaver. Each one of them had at least 20 slash wounds on the head, and the right arm of Kok Peng, the oldest one of them, had been almost chopped off. Chin Li, the youngest one, had slash wounds all over her face. The police arrived to the scene on the same day and launched a massive investigation. There was no sign of forced entry, and nothing was stolen from the house. It appears that the killer had only one goal, and that is to kill the four children. Why though, is a complete mystery. The Tan family didn't have any enemies, and they minded their own business. It's unclear why would someone target them. It has been theorized that the killer may have been a mentally disturbed psychopath, with no actual motive. What is clear though, is that the killer knew personal details about the family, and that he premeditated the murder. The killer was seemingly aware that the mother had undergone sterilization after the birth of the last child. Just two weeks after the horrific murders happened, the Tans received a mysterious letter from an unknown person. The letter contained a picture of happy children playing together, with the words, Now you can have no more offspring, ha ha ha, in Chinese. It was signed off as, The Murderer. The sender addressed the parents by their personal nicknames, Ah Chai and Ah Ring, which proves that the killer knew everything about the family and had chosen to target them in particular. Up to this day, the identity of the killer was never discovered, and the mystery of the horrific Gilang Baru murders, remains unsolved.
During the 1960s, multiple hitchhikers were kidnapped and murdered in Oak Hill, West Virginia. The authorities believe that all the murders were committed by the same person, and the perpetrator was dubbed the Mad Butcher of West Virginia, because authorities never found whole bodies, just pieces of the victims. One of the victims was a mentally disabled man named Mike Rogers. Mike was last seen in the passenger seat of a black station wagon with Ohio tags. A friend driving by saw him, and what happened next is that Mike got out of the car, ran up to his friend, and told him. His friend would basically tell him he was busy running errands, and this was the last time Mike was ever seen alive. Mike simply vanished without a trace and went missing. Some time after his disappearance, the police discovered a trail of body parts scattered on a hillside, in Chimney Corner. At the end of the trail, there was a duffel bag filled with human organs, with price tags from a store in Ohio, and Mike's decapitated head. A .22 caliber bullet was found in his skull. He had been killed execution style, and forensic evidence suggests that Mike had been hung by the neck while being dismembered. A total of 13 body parts were found at the scene, and the liver and kidney that were found in the duffel bag had human bite marks. The police investigated the various disappearances and murders that were related to the Mad Butcher, and even the FBI got involved in the case, though no one was ever convicted of these crimes. The identity of the Mad Butcher remains a complete mystery to this day. Some people believe the Mad Butcher was committed to a mental institution while some believe he may still be active in Oak Hill. On the 18th of November, 1987, Keith Dardine, a 29-year-old man from Ena, Illinois, failed to show up for work. His supervisor called him numerous times, but Keith never answered. The police were contacted on the same day, and they went to check up on the Dardine family, in their small home in the town of Ena. When the police arrived to the house and got inside, they discovered a horrific scene. Keith's wife, Elaine, and his son, Peter, were found lying on the bed. They were both brutally bludgeoned to death with a baseball bat. Elaine was bound and gagged herself. She had been battered to such an extent that she went into labor and gave birth to a girl who was also bludgeoned during the attack. At first, the police thought Keith Dardine murdered his family and ran away. But that would quickly change after his body was later discovered in a wheat field not far from where he lived. The killer shot him three times then chopped off his penis. Also, Keith's blood-splattered car was found parked in front of the Benton police station. Nothing was stolen from the Dardines. A VCR and portable camera were in plain sight in the living room. Elsewhere in the house, equally accessible cash and jewelry remained. So clearly this wasn't a case of a robbery gone wrong. The police weren't able to find any other evidence that might have suggested a motive, though some theories have developed over the years. One theory states that the Dardine massacre was the work of a satanic cult, though this is very unlikely because Satanists usually leave behind symbols at the scene of the crime, and extensively mutilate the bodies of their victims by harvesting certain organs. Another theory suggests that the killer was a jealous lover from high school or college, someone who had a crush on Elaine and decided to murder her because she chose Keith over them. In 2000, serial killer Tommy Lynn Sells confessed to the crime. However, he was never charged as there were doubts about his confessions because all the details he shared about the case were inconsistent. No other suspects have ever been named. The castration serial murders were a group of five related murders that took place in different states in America. Between August 1980 and November 1986, at least five young men from different states were kidnapped, shot in the back of the head, and castrated after their deaths by the same perpetrator. Forensic evidence suggests that two of the victims were shot with the same .38 caliber revolver. What's even more bizarre is the fact that there's a high chance the serial killer is actually a female. One of the victims of the castration serial murders was a man named Marty James Shook, a young hitchhiker from Sparks, Nevada. His naked and mutilated body was found on the 14th of June, 1982, in a mountain pass in Heber City, Utah. 
a mysterious young blonde woman was sighted around the area where his body was discovered. The police believe she might be the killer. Though they were never able to find her, and her identity remains a complete mystery to this day. On the 26th of November, 1986, another victim of the castration serial killer was found in Litchfield, Connecticut. The victim was Jack Franklin Andrews. The murderer castrated him post-mortem and brutally mutilated his corpse, cutting off the legs and head from the torso. Up to this day, there's no proper explanation for the castration serial murders, and the killer who committed these heinous acts was never identified. The Michigan Dogman This humanoid werewolf, or werewolf-like creature was sighted more than 100 times in Michigan. One of the most notable sightings was the one that occurred in 1887. It was the first time the creature was ever sighted. Two lumberjacks in Wexford County saw a creature whom they described as having a man's body and a dog's head. It was seven foot tall, blue-eyed, with the torso of a man and a fearsome howl that sounds like a human scream. Another sighting occurred in the 19th century, in Paris, Michigan. A man named Robert Fortney was attacked by a pack of wild dogs. He was able to scare most of them away by firing a shotgun into the air. But, one seemed completely unfazed by the firearm and instead stood on its hind legs and glared at the man. Reports of similar creatures also came from Allegan County in the 1950s, and in Manistee and Cross Village in 1967. Linda Godfrey, in her book The Beast of Bray Road, compares the Manistee sightings to a similar creature sighted in Wisconsin, known as the Beast of Bray Road. In 1961, a night watchman was patrolling a manufacturing plant in Big Rapids, Michigan, when he saw a peculiar figure. At first he thought it was a person until he saw the dog-like features. He pulled his gun and was about to shoot when he remembered his camera and took it out and took a picture of the horrific beast. The photo has not been analyzed yet, and it still remains an unsolved mystery. Reports of the creature still continue to this day. And the fact that there have been more than 100 sightings of the dogman throughout the past 300 years in Michigan means that there's a high chance that it actually exists. The Yeti Known to inhabit the Himalayan region of Nepal, Bhutan and Tibet, the Yeti, or Abominable Snowman, is a mysterious ape-like creature which is taller than an average human and is covered with brown, grey, or white hair. The Yeti might actually be real and history has proof of its existence. Many explorers, particularly in the Mount Everest area, have reported seeing evidence of this legendary animal. Stories about the snow-dwelling half-man, or half-ape have been popular since the late 19th century. However, reports really begin in 1921, when Lieutenant Colonel Charles was undertaking the British Mount Everest expedition. He reported finding larger-than-usual footprints of a two-footed creature. Four years later, photographer N. A. Tombazi reported seeing a figure with an outline exactly like a human being walking upright. It showed up dark against the snow and wore no clothes. On Mount Everest in 1951, Eric Shipton took photos of large footprints in the snow. Some scientists have argued these photos are the best evidence of Yeti existence. In 1983, Conservationist D.C. Taylor and historian Robert L. Fleming Jr. led an expedition in Nepal and reported seeing large footprints. In December 2007, American TV presenter Joshua Gates led a team to Mount Everest and found footprints measuring 33 centimeters long and 25 centimeters across, with five toes. He also found hair samples which when analyzed, contained unknown DNA samples. Up to today, there's no hard, indisputable, evidence for the Yeti's existence. However, that doesn't deter the true believers of the Yeti. The fact that these mysterious creatures haven't been found is not taken as evidence that they don't exist, but instead how rare, reclusive, and elusive they are. Like Bigfoot, a single body would prove that the Yeti exist, though no amount of evidence can prove they don't exist. The Lizard Man of Scape or Swamp the Lizard Man is a mysterious reptilian humanoid creature that is said to inhabit areas of swampland in and around Lee County, South Carolina. On July 14, 1988, 
the Lee County Sheriff's Office investigated a report of a car, damaged overnight, while parked at a home in the area of Brown Town, on the edges of the scape or swamp. The car reportedly had tooth marks and scratches with hair and muddy footprints left behind. Sheriff Liston Truesdale noted this was the start of various claims that eventually coalesced into a story about a lizard man in the swamp. Prompted by the news of the vehicle damage, 17-year-old local Christopher Davis reported to the sheriff that his car was damaged by a creature he described as green, wet-like, about seven feet tall and had three fingers, red eyes, skin like a lizard, snake-like scales. According to Davis, he was driving home from working the night shift at a fast food restaurant when his car got a flat tire. After fixing it, he saw a creature walking toward him. Davis got in his car and began to drive, but the creature was soon on top of the car. He applied his brakes, causing the creature to roll off the car, giving Davis enough time to escape. The increase in newspaper and media publicity prompted further reports of sightings, and the area soon became a tourist attraction for visitors and hunters. Local radio station WCOS offered a $1 million reward to anybody who could capture the creature alive. In 2015, local television station WCIV featured photos and videos claimed to be Lizard Man, allegedly taken by Jim Wilson and other unidentified individuals. In August 2017, the South Carolina Emergency Management Division sent a tweet regarding possible paranormal activity during the solar eclipse that passed over the area, hinting that people of Lee and Sumter counties should remain vigilant for sightings of the Lizard Man. Regardless of whether or not you believe in the Lizard Man, the elusive monster has become an integral part of the culture of Bishopville over the years and has repeatedly popped up in the media. The Black Demon Shark The Black Demon Shark is believed to be an enormous black shark the size of the Megalodon, located just off the Gulf of California. In recent years, numerous sightings have been reported, primarily from local fishermen. The black demon is said to be between 20 to 60 feet long and weighing anywhere between 50 to 100,000 pounds. It is said to resemble a great white shark but with very dark coloration and a large tail. Some say it could be the megalodon itself, or a new species of shark, or perhaps an unusually large great white. Many expeditions were launched to locate the creature, even on Monster Quest in the chapter Mega Jaws. Nothing became of the investigation. Sadly, sightings are rare. Because of this, not much is known about it. The Jersey Devil The Jersey Devil, also known as the Leeds Devil, is a legendary creature said to inhabit the forest of Pine Barrens in South Jersey. The creature is often described as a flying biped with hooves, but there are many variations. The common description is that of a bipedal kangaroo-like or wyvern-like creature with a horse or goat-like head, leathery bat-like wings, horns, small arms with clawed hands, legs with cloven hooves, and a forked tail. It has been reported to move quickly and is often described as emitting a high-pitched, blood-curdling scream. There have been many claims of sightings and occurrences involving the Jersey Devil. While visiting the Hanover Mill Works to inspect his cannonballs being forged, Commodore Stephen Decatur sighted a flying creature and fired a cannonball directly upon it, to no effect. Joseph Bonaparte, elder brother of Napoleon, is also claimed to have seen the Jersey Devil while hunting on his Bordentown estate about 1820. During 1840, the Jersey Devil was blamed for several livestock killings. Similar attacks were reported during 1841, accompanied by tracks and screams. In Greenwich, during December 1925, a local farmer shot an unidentified animal as it attempted to steal his chickens, and then photographed the corpse. Afterward, he claimed that none of the 100 people he showed it to, could identify it. During the week of January 16 to 23 of 1909, newspapers published hundreds of claimed encounters with the Jersey Devil from all over South Jersey and the Philadelphia area. Among these alleged encounters were claims the creature attacked a trolley car in Haddon Heights and a social club in Camden. Police in Camden and Bristol, Pennsylvania supposedly fired on the creature to no effect. Other reports initially concerned unidentified footprints in the snow, but soon sightings of creatures resembling the Jersey Devil were being reported throughout South Jersey and as far away as Delaware and Western Maryland. The legend of the Jersey Devil has grown over the years and has become ingrained into the culture of New Jersey.
During the 1990s, an Air Force captain stationed in Texas named Gary Sued Brink decided to make a surprise for his parents by visiting them in New York. Without telling anyone, he packed his belongings and drove to the airport to book a flight to New York. While he was in the airport, a mysterious person with a clipboard approached him and started asking really strange questions. Gary described the person as male and of average height. The man asked Gary what's his name, how to spell it, where he's going, and other personal information. Gary thought that the stranger was just some annoying salesman trying to sell him a product, so he ignored him. After Gary boarded the plane, the mysterious man approached him for the second time, sat right next to him, and proceeded to ask him the same questions once again. Gary became angry and told the stranger to fuck off, but the stranger was persistent and kept on asking more questions. Subsequently, the plane crew got involved and forced the man to move away from Gary. Eventually, Gary got to New York and surprised his parents with a visit. While he was at his parents' house, he began receiving phone calls from an unlisted number. When Gary answered the phone, he heard something really, really strange. Take a listen. Yes. I'll tell you who it is. Hello? Yeah. Do you want to speak to him? Is Gary's son Frank there? Yeah, who's this? Steven? Are you playing games with me or what? Huh? Steven, if you're playing games, I'm going to kick your ass. So how long are you going to be back from Texas? Huh? You're being impersonated by the other voice. Yeah, this is you, Steven. You idiot. You're pissing me off. You jerk. I'm going to get you on... <laughs> Let's see what it says. Review. One new call out of area. Is Steven out of the area? Or are you going to be back from Texas? Wait, say that again? You are being impersonated by the other voice. Wait, hold on. Is Steven out of the calling area or what? No, I know. What do you mean you don't know? He's in Queens. Well, who are you talking? I don't know who the fuck. No. Okay, there was a break. Hold on. So how long are you going to be back from Texas? How long am I going to be back from Texas? That question doesn't make any sense. By the other voice. Okay. I'll be coming back eventually. Um, I can't tell you when. You should know that question, the answer to the question, because you seem to know more about me than I do. What was the purpose of these calls? And what message was trying to be conveyed? Was Gary Sued Brink contacted by intergalactic entities on that day? We will never know. On the 20th of September, 1988, an American author named Dean Kuntz was working at his office when he received a mysterious phone call from an unknown individual. When Dean answered the phone, he started hearing what sounded like a distant voice of a woman. The caller only said two words, be careful, and kept repeating them three times. The voice kept getting more distant each time the ominous warning was repeated, and then the line went silent. The voice sounded eerily similar to his mother, but she had been dead for nearly two decades. Kunt's number was enlisted, so there's no way it was a prank call. By this point, Kuntz had a gut feeling that he had just spoken to his deceased mother. A couple of days later, Kuntz went to visit his father, Ray, in the mental facility he had been staying at. Kuntz wasn't aware that his father had a fishing knife in his possession. When Kuntz came into the room, his father attempted to slash him with the knife and Kuntz had to try to wrestle it away from him. As both of them were wrestling over the knife, a witness saw them and immediately informed the authorities. By the time the police arrived, Kuntz had managed to take the knife from his father. The police saw that Kuntz was carrying the knife, so thinking he was the perpetrator, they drew their guns and ordered him to drop the weapon. Kuntz kept insisting he wasn't the guy they're looking for. 
but they didn't believe him and ordered him for the second time to drop the weapon. Kuntz froze for a second. He remembered the mysterious phone warning he received a couple of days ago. Kuntz realized that this was the scenario the caller warned him about, so he immediately dropped the knife. Be careful. In 2007, Courtney Coquendeli's phone began to do really weird and bizarre things on its own. It would often turn itself on, change its ringtones, and send messages to Courtney's friends on its own. After a couple of days, Courtney began to receive mysterious phone calls from someone with a raspy voice. The number that the person called from, Rudd, unknown. The caller told Courtney that he was watching her and began to describe what she was exactly doing at that moment and even what she was wearing. One of the family's neighbors, Andrea McKay, said that she also received similar calls. According to Andrea, she was cutting limes in her kitchen when a mysterious call came through and the voice on the other end told her, I prefer lemons. The Kendall family contacted the police about the calls and the bizarre things that their phones would do on their own. When the police traced the calls, they discovered something really strange. It appears that the calls were actually made from the family's own phones. What's even more bizarre is that this would happen even when the phones are completely turned off. After a couple of days, the calls quickly escalated into serious death threats. According to Heather Kai Kendall, the caller would often tell them, you're going to die, we hate you, we're going to murder you. The calls came at all hours, threatening to behead every single member of the family and murder everyone that they knew, including their pets. The family bought new phones and even switched their numbers. But chillingly, the mysterious calls continued. Up to today, the identity of the caller remains a complete mystery, despite the best efforts of the police. That's it for today's video. If you enjoyed this video, then maybe consider subscribing to the channel because I upload videos like this on a regular basis. Also, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you for watching.